What is up guys, Blue Spooky here as always. Just wanted to let you know before we get into this video, this is the weekly recap of all of the stories told this week. All of the ads will be placed in the beginning and end of the video, so you don't have to worry about watching any ads during the long video if you want to just listen to this while you're falling asleep or in the background or something. Uh, just in case you are trying to fall asleep or something like that, I will leave the background to the screen black so that it's not too distracting. Uh, with that explanation out of the way, without further ado, I will let you guys get straight into enjoying the stories in this video. I live in a small rural community in the eastern United States. It's a nice little town, actually. Because of my work in the medical field, I've met some interesting folks. I'm also familiar with law enforcement and emergency personnel. Small-time life is not as dull and uneventful as people seem to think it is, especially since everybody knows somebody who knows somebody else. I actually have quite a lot of stories to share, but since this one just happened, I guess I'll start here. Because this is very recent and the investigation is still ongoing, I have to be vague with some details, but I feel like I needed to tell someone. I'm single and live alone. Due to a stalker, I've moved twice now, but that's a story for another time. It is relevant to this story, however, for multiple reasons. The first reason being that I have a dog for the sake of protection as well as motion sensors and outdoor security cameras. The second reason being the location of my home which is literally right down the street from the fire department. I can even see it from my living room window, and it's only a couple of blocks from the police station as well. However, next to the fire department is the road department. This is basically a parking lot where they park their road equipment in empty garbage trucks at night and on the weekends. Oddly enough, this one does not have a security camera. Small town life, I suppose. My house sits on a hill with a good view of that side street, due to the incline and the large trees in the front yard, as well as the half cornfield on the property next to me. Most people on the street below wouldn't notice me in the backyard unless they were actively looking. However, I could see the street very clearly. This incident happened Saturday evening. The county was holding its annual Independence Day spiel with a community barbecue, music, fireworks. I didn't attend because it's just not my sort of thing. Plus, I have a dog and the sound of fireworks could be very traumatizing for them. Before the big show, I took the dog out to relieve herself in the backyard. There was still at least an hour of daylight left, but the entire neighborhood was pretty quiet. It seemed most everyone was at the fairgrounds or various other holiday events. So when an unfamiliar large white pickup truck drove slowly down the street, I immediately noticed. It must have turned around at the end of the street because I saw it again, moving in the opposite direction only about 20 seconds later. This time, it turned into the parking lot of the road department. Now, people have been known to toss things into the empty garbage trucks, usually at night to avoid getting caught, because they don't want to or are unable to make the trip to the landfill themselves. Usually it's the standard stuff like furniture or broken down equipment, but I didn't see any of those things in the back of this truck. The driver was a somewhat stocky guy of average height. He took three large black trash bags from the bed of his truck, and tossed them one by one into the hopper of the garbage truck. Then he left. I swear I'm not one of those meddling rear window types who always thinks activity is suspicious and that their neighbors are up to no good, but something about this situation just didn't sit right with me. Normally when I see people tossing their garbage into the trucks and leaving, I don't bother reporting it because it's relatively harmless. But this time, I just had a gut feeling so I called the police right away. If anything, they could get the guy for illegally dumping trash from a barbecue or whatever. While I was on the phone with dispatch, I put my dog inside to cut down on distractions, while the officers went to investigate. A few minutes later, an officer arrived, and I crossed the street to meet with him. I gave a description of the events and pointed out which of the trucks the man had tossed the bags into. He found the bags. He took photos. He put on gloves and told me to stay back. 
The bags were tied in a knot at the top, and it took him a minute to untie one because of the gloves and how tight the knot was. Eventually, he got it open, looked inside for a few seconds, then twisted it closed and took a few steps back. Shit. He hissed under his breath. What is it? I asked. It's a body. I felt sick. I could tell he felt sick, too. I saw him grow pale, his hand trembling when he held the radio. Even his voice was shaking as he gave the code to dispatch. The dispatcher sounded so confused when she asked him to repeat it. Within ten minutes, the county sheriff was on the scene. Even he looked sick at the contents of whatever was in the bag. The coroner arrived about ten minutes after that, and the first officer walked me back into the house, along with another one who arrived at the scene the same time as the coroner. Though I showed the first cop via the app on my phone when I described the events initially, I now showed them the video on a larger screen. The camera caught footage of the truck as it drove by both times, as well as pulling into the parking lot, though unfortunately not a clear view of the license plate or of the man tossing the bags out of frame. We watched the footage over and over, pausing frames while the officers took notes. Ultimately, they requested this footage as well as the copy of the files from the past week to see if the truck had canvassed the area before. I've also been saving footage until the road department installs their own camera this week. Because this is still fresh, I don't know many more details. I do know that the body was in pieces, but I don't know the age of the victim, the gender, the cause of death, none of that. Information hasn't been released to the public yet. I don't even know if the coroner has been able to identify the body yet. A police cruiser has been parked at the fire department next door for constant surveillance, just in case the guy comes back. They think the guy who dumped the body was likely a local. I mean, how else would he have known to dump the body there? He probably thought it'd get buried under people's illegal trash accumulated over the holiday weekend, and the sanitation crew wouldn't have bothered to investigate. When I think about how I know this guy lives in my community, it makes me physically ill. To think that he had clearly scouted the area for a dump site, that it may not have been the first time this had happened, that this could happen all over again. If I hadn't called it in, if I hadn't been in the backyard at that exact moment, or if I had ignored that gut feeling, that victim would have never been found and may never have found potential justice. Their loved ones may have never had closure, in fact, there's still a possibility it just might happen again to another poor soul. I hope it's not me. I think now's a good time to move again. I mean, third time's the charm, right? Hi, this is my first post, so I'll do my best to make this interesting. This happened to me in the summer of 2015. I was dating a guy who lived in the city, and I was living at home at the time in the suburbs. Neither of us had a car, and since I lived at home with my bedroom right next to my grandma's, I always went to him. I'd take the subway to his place every week and stay for a couple of days I had off from work. To get to his apartment required taking two trains. One day I was headed to see him. It was super hot out and I was wearing a skirt with straps, a crop top, and knee-high socks. Hey, I wanted to look cute. I guess I feel this is important as I probably stood out wearing this outfit, and unfortunately I probably should have been more careful about what I was wearing, which sucks. Anyway, I'm on the first train and after a few stops I notice a man get on. I kind of couldn't not notice him as he chose to stand right in front of me where I was sitting and stare at me rather than take up one of the numerous empty seats. It made me feel really weird, and the man in general gave me a very creepy vibe. He was probably in his 40s, looked unkempt but otherwise kind of just basic looking. I can't even really picture his face now. So I get off at the last stop and head through the station to where I need to catch the second train. I noticed the guy following me off, which at first I figured wasn't a big deal. I mean, it was perfectly possible he might have just been going to the same place. So to get to the platform I needed to be, you have to go up some stairs. I realized he was following right behind me. I decided to turn around and go to a different platform, which happened to be packed full with people. 
thinking if he followed me then, this was bad, but maybe I could lose him in the crowd. Well, he did in fact follow me. I tried to duck out of view before going back to the actual platform I needed to be waiting on. I got there, and for a few minutes I did feel better, until I saw him sneaking up again. He must have known I'd be there after I'd gone up there and then turned around. Plus, it was the only other platform, and most likely he'd seen me the entire time. There weren't too many people waiting compared to the other side, but a few trains came that were so full I didn't bother to try to get on, and neither did he. The whole time I was texting my boyfriend, who was not taking me seriously at all. I asked he at least meet me at the station when I got to the stop by his apartment, just a five minute walk away. He was being very reluctant, but he finally agreed. At this point though, I was still waiting for a train. One came in that was very full, but I was getting restless and wanted to get to a safe place, so I squeezed on. The other man squeezed right next to me, with his arm over me. In that split second, I decided that even with all these people around, I was not safe. So right before the doors closed, I hopped out. The train left with the guy still on it, staring at me out the window as it pulled away. I waited for a few more trains to come and go, worried the guy would be waiting for me at the next stop or something. I got on a train finally, paying attention to everyone who got on at each stop. He never did though, and I made it to my final destination greeted by my boyfriend who seemed very put out by having to walk over. He is now an ex-boyfriend and was generally just kind of shitty. I'm really proud of myself for getting off that train at the last second. I don't know how much danger I was in, but I know that that man was following me and it definitely wasn't for any wholesome reason. Despite being in public as well, I feel like if he had tried anything, no one would have done shit and I'm very small and not a strong person either. Hey, my name is Emily. I'm 23 and I live in Kentucky. So in the summer of 2018, I was sort of in between gigs to pay for college, so I decided to work in a gym. I live in a small city, and for context, the gym was in the middle of nowhere near only an abandoned retirement home and a gas station, plus a few miles from a Target and a CVS. Kind of sketch, but pretty modern and safe. In the gym, there's a front desk with a narrow hallway, first floor for men's dressing rooms, treadmills, weights. The third floor is women's dressing rooms, plus pretty much everything else. One night, me and my 17-year-old colleague were the only ones left there to close, and there was a bunch of people still working out. We make our announcement about closing in 20 minutes and people start to leave. There's this one guy on a treadmill with headphones in, so I tapped on his shoulder to tell him we were closing soon. He smiled and nodded and asked what my name was. I told him my name and smiled back. His face suddenly falls and he tells me, Well, Emily, if you don't blow me right now, I'm not going anywhere. So fuck off, you little cunt. I was in shock but decided to let him do his thing until we closed because I was too scared to say anything else. I went to go clean the machines with my colleague and tell him what happened. He suggested we call our supervisor. I did. She told me to just keep the gym open until he left, because he probably won't stay for long, and we'll get paid overtime either way. We do our thing, and as expected, everyone except him leaves. About the guy. Well, he's a six foot four broad man. Black sweatsuit, and honestly not very clean cut. He strongly smelled like alcohol, and didn't seem like someone who took care of themselves. Me and this 5'3 high schooler were scared already. After about 40 minutes, my coworker is cleaning out the dressing rooms and I'm at the front desk when I hear him stomping down the stairs. He checks out and stays to chat with me. He apologized for earlier and told me he didn't like it when women tried to boss him around. Then he asked for my number. I told him I had a boyfriend who was picking me up from work, which was a lie, but I didn't want him to wait around the building for me to get out. He joked about if he kidnapped me I would be all his, and told me he'd killed someone before for a woman. I was in shock. He kept talking but I was frozen. He mentioned how he owned me now, 
and was going to watch over me. He then told me good night and went down the last stairs to the front door. I went back in to finish up, basically in tears. This is where I made a mistake. I should have instantly locked the front door, but I didn't. About 30 minutes later, when I'm left alone to close, I head down the corridor to leave. In the darkness, I could see someone crouching behind the desk. I thought it might be my co-worker, so I called out his name. There was no response. I got a bit closer. Then I smelled a very strong sweat and alcohol from that guy from earlier. I got a gut feeling to go upstairs and text my co-worker. He told me he already left and that I should call the police right away. While I was sitting in the locked bathroom, I heard him walk into the women's dressing rooms and call out my name. I waited for a good 20 minutes before the police showed up to arrest him. Turns out he wasn't kidding about all that and had in fact gunned down a man before. The very next day, I handed in my 20 days, and only worked in malls after that. I bought a house recently, and had a surprise guest. My partner and I recently bought our first home. The day of closing, the selling realtor tells us the seller didn't give her the keys to the house, and claims to have never had a garage door opener. When asked about when we can obtain the keys, the selling realtor says the seller works an hour away and long hours. This meant we couldn't get the keys until 9 or 10 at night. Instead, the selling realtor arranged and paid for new locks on the front door and gave us money to buy garage door openers. Yay, three locks, I guess. So we close on the house and everything else was pretty much smooth sailing. That was until when I went up to set up and turn on our electricity. The electric company said they couldn't come out to turn on our power until the next day, even though I had called early in the morning. I rolled my eyes profusely. The house needed a good cleaning as well, as the seller didn't even bother to clean it when they moved out. Let me first tell you about the house layout. When you walk through the front door, it opens to the living area with the kitchen to the left. A nice big open concept. Part of the kitchen is hidden from the front door due to the stairs leading to the basement, so you can't see the oven or the fridge. The neighborhood is one of the safest ones in my area. I had to use the front door to move things in, since the locks were installed before I came by, so I didn't bother locking the door. Since I didn't have electricity yet, I decided to start by cleaning the fridge I turned on a true crime slash true horror podcast in the background and started to get to work. The doors to the fridge were wide open and I was doing my thing when a shadow suddenly appeared behind me. I knew this couldn't be my partner because he was out teaching. I turned around to see a man in a black hoodie and black shorts telling me he was headed to drop off a garage door opener. He dropped this thing on the island and didn't say another word. It seemed maybe I spooked him just as much as he spooked me, because he didn't say anything else and ran out the door immediately. It took me a while to compose myself again, and calling my partner hoping he's on break to tell him what happened. I also texted our realtor about this. It was a very weird interaction. I thought about if I just didn't hear a knock or something because I was in the zone. But he had never knocked. I know this because less than an hour later... Another man knocked on the door and explained he was here to drop off a key to the front door. If he tried the doorbell, well of course I couldn't hear that because there was no electricity. We're still doing work in the house before we officially move in, but I'm now ultra spooked being in the house alone. This happened in 2019. I was in my second year of college and living in a townhome about a 10 minute walk away from campus. I lived with two other girls at the time but they were all back at their parents house for the holiday. I work in healthcare and was working Christmas this year. For a little bit of backstory, there used to be four of us living there but one girl had moved out due to issues with her boyfriend. He was a real jackass who abused our kindness on allowing him to stay there. He was only supposed to come every so often, 
but he basically ended up living there. We told her she needed to kick him out after an incident with him one night after he got physical with her, and verbally abusive toward the rest of us. She wouldn't listen though, and we told her we would have to talk to our landlord then. Long story short, she ended up moving out, and left on pretty bad terms with us. On another side note here, I have been in physically and mentally abusive relationships before, so I understand how things may have been going for her. I tried my best for two years at that point to help her open her eyes to the abuse and get her away from him. At this point though, it was affecting everyone, and we didn't feel safe with him there. So, she moved out in the end. Okay, so back to the story. It was Christmas Eve and I worked the next day, so I was getting ready for bed. Locked all the doors, turned the lights off, I went downstairs to where my bedroom was. I was scrolling on TikTok for about an hour. It was Christmas Day at this point, when I heard what sounded like chairs in the kitchen move. The kitchen is right above my bedroom. I thought maybe I was hearing the neighbors next door, as we share the same walls and sometimes they can be quite loud. But I remembered one of them texting me, asking me to bring in a package they were expecting while they were all gone from home. The noise was short-lived, so I just brushed it off at first. Next thing I know, though... My bedroom door was being opened slowly. In this moment, I got a flashback and remembered my second grade teacher telling us about the time someone broke into her house. She acted as if she were asleep so that if they were just there to rob her, they wouldn't feel the need to hurt her if she saw them. I realized in the next second though that my freaking phone screen was lighting up my scared, jaw-dropped face. I couldn't exactly act like I was asleep. Where I'm laying in bed faces directly to the door, so we were just looking right at each other. There I was, laying in my bed, shitting myself, while this guy had one foot in my bedroom with the door cracked open. It felt like an eternity, but in reality was probably more like ten seconds of us staring at each other. He slowly took his foot out and closed my door. I sat there just in complete and utter shock. I couldn't make out what he looked like as my eyes were adjusting to the dark again from the phone screen. All I could see was he had a backwards baseball cap. I knew I had to call the police, but my anxious ass knew that if I called, it would alert my parents' phones that I had done so. Me being dumb as hell at the time, I thought, well, I don't want to make them worry. Also, I was scared he might still be somewhere in the house, and I didn't know what he would do if he heard me calling. I texted the guy I was seeing at the time and told him, some random guy just broke into my house and came into my room. He snapped me out of it and told me to call the police, so I did. The dispatcher asked me if I felt comfortable to go unlock the front door for them so they didn't have to break it down. I told her, no way. I don't care if the door is broken, I'm not going up there alone. A couple minutes later, I saw flashlights shining through my window. I heard the police knocking at the door and announcing themselves. They got in and asked me where I was. I came out of my room and they came and got me. They told me to wait on the back porch while two of them searched the house and one stayed with me. It was like that shit you see in the movies where they have their guns and turn the corner with their partner and everything. They didn't find anyone and I said nothing looked like it had been taken. They even tried to get fingerprints but were unsuccessful in the end. Then they started asking me questions and informed me that the back door was unlocked and had no signs of being broken. I told them I'd locked it though. Luckily, the guy I was talking to stayed with me that night, but I still couldn't sleep. I kept having to go check every inch of the house over and over. I placed chairs under all the door handles on the front door, back door, and my bedroom. The next day, I informed our landlord, and she refused to come out and change the locks. She never ended up getting them changed for the rest of the time we lived there. Every time I go to bed now, I triple check all the doors have been locked. Doesn't matter where I am. I also have a dog now, and he helps my anxiety of intruders, as well as my recent purchase of a ring doorbell. I believe it was our old roommate's boyfriend. I think they may have made an extra key for him because he was basically living there. But I don't understand why he didn't do anything to me, the house, or our belongings. If it were someone random, I don't know why they wouldn't have done what they intended, and that could have been many different possibilities.
Now, I don't know what their intentions were that night, but to the man who broke into my house on Christmas Eve, let's not meet again. I've been on this sub for a couple years now, had my own couple let's not meet moments, but for some reason tonight, I just needed to share what happened. For context, I'm in school still and work for my family member on certain weekends at a local college selling concessions at the stadium. It's about once or twice a month, and the stadium is off toward the edge of town. Well, it's a Friday night. I had just gotten out of school and had to go straight to work. I get to work, work for four hours, a half shift tonight. And my boss tells me we need more spoons for tomorrow's event. We sell ice cream and these events have like 5,000 plus people at them. I said okay. I'd go grab them on my way home. The only store open with heavy duty spoons is all the way on the other side of town. I still wanted to meet up with some of my friends and mess around that night. I decided to take the faster but more sketchy way around the outskirts of town. I live in a relatively weather bipolar state. It snowed last night, but I figured the roads would be fine enough even if they weren't plowed. I took off to the store and the first five minutes go by and nothing's wrong. I haven't seen a single car or any buildings the entire time, but keep in mind it's approaching 9pm and I'm on the outskirts of town. No one usually really takes this way unless they really have to. All of a sudden though, I see something out of the corner of my eye. It looks like a man. Roughly five foot eight, I'd say. Wearing shorts, a t-shirt, and a backwards hat. He's in the ditch walking through the snow when it's all of ten degrees out. My immediate thought was to pull over to help, but I was on the phone with my mom at the time, and she warned me not to, as some things had happened before in this town. For example, a couple years ago, a college girl was kidnapped and found dead, rolled up in a rug in 2014. I still considered stopping for a moment, but for some reason I convinced myself not to. I wasn't really worried about anything. I was a young dude driving a big pickup truck, the last type of person anyone would want to harm, right? I passed the man going about 40 miles per hour. Like I said, the roads aren't the best. I drove not even 500 feet past him, and immediately... A car that I did not see at all before turned on and pulled out of a field entrance off the road and started to follow behind me. At first, I thought I was just focused on the man in the ditch and didn't see a road. I later found out that there was not even one there. Now again, I was not super worried. I've watched my fair share of crime movies and read plenty of stories and I didn't feel it was a threat yet. I start to approach the town again and I have to take some turns to get to where I'm going. I turn left. The car turns left. I turn right. The car turns right too. I go around this roundabout and skip my turn and go twice as no one else was there. The car followed me exactly. At this point, I started to worry a little. But maybe they just needed to go to the store also. I then pulled up to a stop sign. I wasn't on the best side of town either, may I add and turned without my turn signal. The car followed behind me. Now at this point, I should have went straight to the police station, but I still didn't think of that. I was two miles from the store now, and there would be plenty of people there. I took a few more turns, and the car continued to follow close behind. I completely blew a stop sign at a non-busy intersection, and the car did a quick stop and go and caught up. At that point, I was only two turns until the store. I turned in, and the car turned in also. The store also had a gas station, so I pulled there first to act like I was getting gas. The car pulled off to the side of the road in between the station and the store, and sat there waiting. I waited for about ten minutes, and the car still didn't make any moves. At that point, I was starting to get really worried. I was a young kid, alone at night, near the bad side of town. I called my friends I was supposed to meet up with later on, and gave them the license plate for worst case scenario. I then took off to the store. As I crossed the street, the car pulled in straight behind me. I was freaking out, not knowing if I should call the cops or not. I go and park as close as possible to the store. 
a car parked three rolls behind me and a couple down. It's getting late at this point, and the store was closing soon. There were only a couple others in the lot. I turn my truck back on and go to park on the complete opposite side, get out and bolt inside the store. I'm not exactly super overweight, but I'm not like a skinny stick either. I'm about six foot one and 200 pounds. Who would want to fight me? I get spoons and take my time in the store. I go to call my friends to walk back outside, and I discover my phone is now dead. I looked out the sliding doors and noticed there was suddenly a white van parked next to my driver's side. It looked like no one was in it, but the back windows were completely covered and it was running. Very big red flag. I ran to customer service and explained everything. They didn't believe me. Thought I was some young kid just messing around. At the time, I did not see the original follow car, but no way in hell was I going outside with that kidnapper van next to my truck. After waiting for what seemed like hours, but was really only 30 minutes, the van pulled forward, and the original car appeared from the side of the building. From the in-store Starbucks window, I saw them talk, and then both drive off. I waited another 10 minutes and dashed outside. I sped to my friend's house, and when I got there, I parked in his garage. My one buddy asked me why there was a big orange mark on my tire. My heart just sunk. When I was inside, the follow car must have marked my tire. After inspecting the rest of the truck, I found a small pipe dropped in the bed of my trunk surrounded by snow. It was about two inches wide, and I'd say about 18 inches long, wrapped up in duct tape. It was obviously not mine. I was alone, no phone, scared, in a part of town I'm not familiar with. I tried to laugh it off, but now that everyone was asleep, I couldn't help but think about what would have happened if I'd walked outside. I've always been sort of ego-boosted on the fact I'm a chubby, fat dude no one would want to mess with, but after tonight, I realized just about anyone can be targeted. Legit like three people know this story because I don't talk about it. The events happened 13 years ago, and it still messes with me to this day, even though I'm not in any sort of danger now. When I was in college, I got super depressed and stressed out near my junior year. I was always super into school, but I just started slipping near the end of my college terms. It threw me off real bad. I'd never experienced failing at subjects before. It threw me into this ridiculous stress. I graduated and figured everything would go away with that, but instead I found myself feeling very mentally foggy. My sister knew how bad off I was from the last years of school, so she hatched a plan to surprise me. I always wanted to go to Miami growing up. I know how lame that sounds. But you gotta understand, being a girl who grew up in the Midwest and even went to college there, it was super exciting looking to me. Up to this point, I had traveled but never went anywhere as lively or big as Miami always seemed to be. My sister planned a five-night vacation with me as a way to get me out of this mental fog and also to celebrate in our own way me graduating college. I was honestly super excited. A few months passed by and it was now time for the trip. We got there and the first few nights were incredible. We hit up the restaurants I had on my little list of places to try and spent many hours by the ocean. I was never a real big party girl. Up to this point in my life, I was drunk maybe twice. My sister was the opposite. She was in nearly every party that happened in our hometown. She got bored of going back to the room so early every night and convinced me to go to a nightclub with her for the first time. I fought it a bit, but let my guard down, because I was feeling great for the first time in a long time, and I wanted to try some new things. It was a Saturday night downtown, in the middle of summer. We get to this nightclub, and the line is legit wrapped around the whole building. It was massive. We waited in line for what felt like forever before we were finally let in. I walked in the door and felt like I got shot because of the loudness. My sister dragged me to the bar and ordered some shots of some drink with a funny name. Again, I decided to just let my guard down and try new things. 
As more shots went down, I decided that would be the theme of the night, trying new stuff out. I was aware of how boring I was, and was in my opinion in the most exciting place in the world. After 45 minutes into dancing and drinking, I became very drunk, borderline blackout. I was very sloppy drunk and was well aware of it. I found myself laying on a couch thing in the upstairs area overlooking the dance floor as my sister was dancing with some guys. As I sat there trying to consciously sober myself up, I realized how badly I had to pee. I brought myself up to a sitting position on the couch to stand up and walk to the nearby restroom. As I sat up, a massive man quickly sat close to me. I could feel his leather pants pressed on my leg. He was huge, absolutely over six feet tall, and looked like some sort of bodybuilder. Admittedly, he was very good looking, but I was so wasted I wasn't even trying to flirt. I just really had to find the bathroom. He smiled at me and yelled over the music, something like, leaving so soon? I remember nervously laughing and attempting to get up, but he grabbed onto my dress and pulled me back down to a sitting position next to him. His smile went away immediately, and he spoke in a very deep tone. I don't remember telling you that you were allowed to leave, bitch. Even though I was very drunk leading up to this, I felt like this sobered me up within seconds. I had never had someone talk to me like that before. But I wasn't just going to allow this guy, no matter how much bigger he was than me, to do that to me. I attempted to stand up again and he did the exact same thing but much more aggressively. I thought I was insanely rude, but I wasn't afraid because of how many people were around me. He tapped my heels with his big yellow leather boots and said, I couldn't help but notice how much I want to fuck your feet. My fight or flight kicked in. I slapped him in the face and stood up to walk away. I was very uncomfortable. I wasn't afraid just because of the sheer amount of people around. As I was walking away, I could hear him laughing. I'm trying to decide if I want to keep your feet after I cut the rest of your sexy body up into little pieces. I still hear it in my mind play out as clear as day. I walked away, very quickly, as I attempted to search for my sister on the dance floor from above. I couldn't find her anywhere. I decided to take my phone out to text her, just to see I had missed a call from her. I was out of eye shot from the dude, and cut away to the bathroom so I could call her back. It was still pretty loud in there, but it wasn't loud enough where she couldn't hear me on the phone. I went into a stall and called her back. As I was in the stall, I heard the bathroom door slowly open, and someone went into the one directly next to me. I was waiting for her to pick up when I looked down underneath the stall and saw those same very distinct yellow leather boots. He was just standing there next to me. I felt like I was about to die. I knew he knew I was in there. I held my breath and hung up the phone just staring at those shoes, not moving a single bit from when he shut the door. I heard the main bathroom door open again, and I immediately ran out the stall, out the door, and straight to outside the club without slowing down once. I was terrified. It just so happened my sister was close to where I came out, trying to ask me if I was ready to leave. I told her we needed to get back as soon as possible. We got back to the room safely, and I told her everything that happened. She suggested calling the police, but I just really wanted to drop it. We changed our flight, and the next night flew back home. I searched for a few years, pretty actively online, for arrests in the area to see if he would ever come up. He never did. After a few years, I moved on mentally and got over it for the most part. It was hands down the scariest moment in my life. I don't know who this guy was or if he was saying things to scare me or if he was completely serious. This story is not one where I was the target of someone's stalking or harassment, but one where I was the person who was in the right place at the right time. I'm fairly certain my inadvertent intervention may have saved someone I'd never met from, well, who knows what. This happened back in 2015 or 2016, I'd say. I'm a career tow truck driver. At this point, I've been towing cars for most of my adult life, and will likely do so until either I retire or die, whichever comes first. 
At the time, I was working for a pretty small towing company with only two employees. We rotated out who was on call each weekend. It just so happened it was my weekend on call. It was summer, so with people being out and about late and whatnot, I was pretty busy. Cleaning up accidents, towing broken down cars both in the city and off the highway, I was fine with it, as I was paid commission at the time. So, the more calls I took, the more money I made. It was a Saturday night, now Sunday morning. It was around 2 or 3 o'clock. Like I said, I had been very busy. I was tired, a little grumpy, and kind of wanted to just go home when my phone rang. It was an insurance company calling and asking if we could do a tow for one of their customers who had broken down on the side of the highway. The breakdown location they gave me was about 15 miles out of town. I normally wouldn't do something so far, but it just so happened the tow destination was next to a dealership that was only a couple of minutes away from my apartment. I contemplated rejecting the call for a moment, but because I'm paid commission, I figured, screw it. I can run up, grab this car, drop it off around the corner from my place, and then hopefully head straight home, get a couple hours of quality shut-eye. I took the call and hopped on the highway. The insurance company provided me with the customer's first name which we'll say was Kara for the purposes of this story. They also gave me a phone number for her. Normally, I usually try to make contact with people who are on the side of the highway to let them know I'm on my way and give them an ETA. I tried calling her a few times, but she did not answer. Not totally unusual. After a short while, I saw hazard lights up the way on the shoulder, so I turned on my strobes and started slowing down. As I approached closer, I noticed that not only is there the late model car that I'm looking for, but there was also another car on the scene as well that didn't have its hazards on. It was parked in front of the car I was meant to tow. This is annoying, but not uncommon, as I need to be able to get in front of the disabled car in order to load it, and sometimes people don't realize that. Because the other car is there, I pulled up behind both cars, you do this so that as the tow driver, you're the one that has to make the weird maneuver of pulling off the shoulder and back onto the shoulder, and the other car can just drive straight forward. Otherwise, if I pulled up front, then the other car would have to go around me. It's unprofessional and unsafe to make customers do that. Standing at the trunk of the late model car, which was now directly in front of me, was a man and a woman. The woman was probably in her early 20s and dressed to the nines for a night out. She was about five foot one or five foot two, wearing tight leatherish pants, a halter top, long black hair, and was generally very pretty. The man was probably around 5'10 and skinny, maybe 150 or 160 pounds, wearing a dark hoodie and dirty jeans. They were very close, facing each other. She had her arms crossed and he was leaning down to talk to her. I stepped out of my truck and approached them both. They separate a few feet. I looked at the woman and said, Are you Cara? She nodded and I said I was there from her insurance company. I asked what was going on with the car. Immediately, the man piped up and said, Yeah, it's just having some fuel issues. Easy fix. Can you just drop it off at this commuter parking lot? I'm going to fix it for her there. I was rather annoyed by this. The commuter lot in question was further up the highway and I was already 15 miles out of town. I really wanted to go home. Not only that, but in order to change the original tow destination, I would have to call the insurance company back, wait on hold for who knows how long for a representative, then let them know of the change and try to get them to pay me extra for the deadhead miles back home after unloading. I really didn't want to go through all that. Thirdly, this was a late model car. Now, I'm no mechanic, but I knew it was new enough that whatever was wrong with it was likely still covered under warranty. The dealership would be the best place to go anyway. I explained all this to the man, but he was really not having it. He got stern with me. Look, man, you just need to take the car where I tell you to take it. We went back and forth on this for maybe 60 seconds, him getting madder all the while. Well, you know what, man? You're not the named in short. Cara is. The easy way to settle this is to ask what she wants me to do with the car and whatever she says I'll do. Fingers crossed, she'll want me to take it to the dealership. I turned to look at Kara to ask her that question. I didn't see her right away. 
She was no longer standing where she was just a minute ago, which was slightly off to my right. I continued not to see her until I'd turned all the way around, because she was standing directly behind me. And by directly, I mean within an inch of my back, arms still crossed. I looked down at her, and she locked eyes with me. Her eyes were as wide as plates, almost owl-like. Immediately, it felt like she was staring into my soul. She didn't say a word, but she didn't have to. I took a step back and did what felt like a double take. I looked at him, then her, then him again. It slowly started to dawn on me that maybe something wasn't quite right here. Hey, do you know this guy? She ever so slightly shook her head no. The expression on her face when I asked her that will forever be burned in my skull. I immediately turned to the guy. Hey, you gotta go, man. Now, I'm not a tough guy. I'm a total beta male if there is such a thing, and I don't care who knows it. Now, I've got nothing to prove to anyone. I'm super averse to confrontation and will run at the first sign of trouble. I'm not exactly big either. I'm five foot eight, have a bit of a gut, but also big thighs and broad shoulders. People are generally surprised to find out I weigh as much as I do. I think that might have been my saving grace for what happened next. Without another word, the guy started to move for Kara. I moved to stay in between them. He tried to push me out of his way by shoving me in the chest. He only pushed me hard enough to make me take a single step back. Immediately, I took a step forward and body checked him as hard as I could, hard enough to knock him over onto his ass. Kara was now in front of me to my right, somewhat between me and the guy who was trying to scramble to his feet. I reached up and snatched the poor girl by her waist, spun her towards my truck, and yelled for her to get into the driver's side. I turned back to the guy, who was standing up again at this point, breathing heavily. He got right up in my face. I stared him down and mustered up the best dad voice I could. You need to go. I was shaking. I was terrified. I didn't know if he had a weapon. I didn't know if he was going to try to fight me or stab me. I didn't know what I would do if he did. Like I said, I'm not a tough guy. I don't even know how to fight. I've never even been in a fight in my whole life. What if I get badly hurt? What do I even do now? I just wanted to go home. I wasn't even going to take this damn call. All of this was running through my head at lightning speed. After 15 seconds or so, which felt like eons, he huffed a bit, smiled one of the creepiest smiles I'd ever seen, and started to back off. Sucking his teeth and rubbing his hands together, he slowly walked backwards a few steps, then made his way to the front car, got in, and drived off. I stayed motionless watching him until I could no longer see his taillights. I got Kara's car loaded up onto the tow truck. As we made our way to the dealership, she told me through tears that her car had shut off while she was driving. She had pulled onto the shoulder and called her parents because she was on their insurance. Her parents made the call to the company, who eventually dispatched me to her location. While she was there waiting for me, a bit after she'd made the call, some random guy pulled up in front of her and walked to her passenger side window to try and talk to her. She told him she was fine, that a tow truck was coming, and that she didn't need help. He persisted. She tried to tell him off and eventually tried to roll up the window. He stuck his arm in the window and unlocked the door, then pulled it open. In fear, she jumped out and left her phone inside and ran to the back of her car. He started getting pretty lewd with her, and whenever she tried to go back to her car, he would prevent her from getting in physically. Several minutes later, I finally showed up. Who knows what would have happened had the timing been any different. Her parents were waiting at the dealership when we arrived, and she told them what just happened. Her parents gave me a $20 tip, which was all the cash they had on them at the time. She gave me a very tight and clearly heartfelt hug before I left. I never saw her again after that. I tell you what, every guy has daydreamed at some point of coming to the rescue of a pretty girl in trouble, myself included. You think you're gonna be a hero, that you're gonna be the cat's ass, you're gonna slay the dragon and get the girl and ride off into the sunset like the king you are. But for me, being in that situation... In the moment, it was one of the most terrifying feelings I've ever had in my life. 
forced into a confrontation I didn't want nor was prepared for, not knowing what to expect from a clearly not well-hinged individual. I didn't feel like the cat's ass. I didn't feel like a hero. I felt like a scared little kid encountering a bully on the playground for the first time. I know now for the future, though, that if I'm ever in a situation like that, I will never not intervene. I just really hope I don't have to again. This story happened a few years ago. I was in my early 20s and was studying in Paris, France. I was going home from uni. I usually took a short bus ride and walked the rest of the way home. That day, though, I felt slightly uncomfortable. I could sense some guy looking very intensely at me. I was used to the occasional unpleasant, unsolicited gazes, but this time his gaze felt beastly. It's hard to explain why, but I felt like I was prey being stalked. I decided because of this to get off the bus a few stops early. I wanted to avoid him and didn't want him to see where I usually got off the bus. Like I learned in the movies, I waited until someone else pressed the stop button and waited until the very last moment to stand up and leave. I did not notice him getting off the bus. Just as I was beginning to feel the relief of having escaped an uncomfortable situation, I looked over my shoulder, only to see that there he was, just a few meters behind. I had the distressing feeling that his eyes looked away just the moment I turned to see him. I walked into a shop, took my phone, and pretended to be making a call. When I couldn't see him anymore, I exited from the shop and made my way home as fast as I could. I kept looking back into the busy street. I zigzagged, crossed the street at every crossing. Finally, after not noticing him for a while, I believed that him getting off at the same stop as me was just a coincidence. When I reached my building, though, I looked back one last time, and there he was. His alarming gaze was on me, smirking. I ran up to my apartment, climbing the stairs four at a time, I reached the top floor, squeezed through my door, locked it, and froze. My intercom was ringing. Don't ask me why I picked it up. I regretted it the very moment I did. I could hear the opposite flat intercom ringing as well. He had pressed all of the buttons one by one, hoping someone would open. But now, he knew my name. Gabrielle? Oh shit, I felt like a deer in the headlights frozen. Open the door, please, he said in a pleading voice. I, I just really want to talk to you. Somehow, I couldn't move or speak. Hey, c come to the window, he added. Look at me. You'll see I'm not a bad guy. Something clicked in my head. He wanted to locate my apartment in the building. I was not going to make that mistake. I hung up in shock. I waited by the door without moving for what seemed like hours. When I finally managed to calm myself down, I called my long-distance boyfriend. He told me to call the police immediately. So, why didn't I call them? I don't really know. Today, it would be the very first thing I would think to do. The fear of making a big deal out of something not important, perhaps. What an idiot I was for thinking that. I called my best friend instead. I just didn't want to feel alone. I told her all about it, and after a while, I felt better and safe. We started laughing together. Suddenly, though, the intercom rang once again. Two hours had passed since I'd come home and the incident had first begun. I answered it. Gabrielle, said the voice. Open, please. I still remember the chills I felt. He was still there. He had been there all this time. I was silent, petrified. He was silent, but I could sense his trepidation. Gabrielle, let me in. I'm so thirsty. Just at least give me a glass of water. This broke the tension. I hung up. Curled up in a corner, literally in recovery position. Terrified. I waited. I was scared to make a sound. I knew he couldn't hear me from the hall, but I was scared to even breathe. The intercom rang again, and again. I didn't answer this time. I crouched on the sofa and fell asleep in exhaustion. 
I heard the intercom ring one more time in the middle of the night. I woke up that morning, afraid to even leave my apartment. I called my dad who came to pick me up. There was no one in the hall, but there was a note in my mailbox. Gabrielle, I really am a nice guy. You should have opened me. We immediately went to the nearest police station. The police listened and of course told me that I should not hesitate to call them next time. My dad called a locksmith to install digicode on the building door the same day and wrote a message to each of my neighbors, asking them not to open the door to anyone they didn't expect. After that, he sat in the cafe in front of my building with two friends every evening for more than a week. And I never saw the stalker again. After this episode, I used a different route to and from uni every day. I kept my phone tightly in my hand and looked back every few meters. Even today, I'm still very observing of my surroundings. I never answer the door if I'm not expecting someone. So, people, if you ever find yourself in any kind of uncomfortable situation, call the police. Don't be an idiot like me. Be safe, everyone. Sorry in advance for the long post. I just need to get this off my chest. My fiancé, 27 and male, and I, 23 and female, are soon to be married and are remodeling an old family home. We started working on the house about two or three months ago. My fiancé bought a bunch of power tools to use on the house to renovate. It's been sitting with nobody in it for over a year now. Keep in mind this house is also located in a fairly rural area. A few houses and trailers here and there, but not too much traffic overall. We have a rodent problem as well, and have been setting up some traps to try and catch them. Three weeks ago, my fiancé went to check the traps, and we had a rat that was still alive. Long story short, he didn't want to take care of it, so he left. I got off work at 9pm, and went over to the house to take care of that rat. It was raining, and my mom and brother came with me. I went to the back door. It was wide open, and water was blowing into the house. I was extremely pissed. I thought my fiancé had left the door open when he left. I shut it and quickly finished my business there. I asked my fiancé why he'd left the door open, and he claimed right away he didn't. I called bullshit and left it at that. It didn't ever occur to me that somebody might have just possibly made a quick getaway. Fast forward to today. My fiancé and I went to our house to throw a whole bunch of trash and stuff into the dumpster we rented. When we went inside, we immediately noticed that some things were missing. Drills, sanders, we realized that they had been stolen. We call my mother-in-law and tell her about it. She said to make a police report. What scares me so much about this is that everything began to click with the rat trap incident. Somebody had been scoping us out. I would go to our house by myself on many occasions and always get those creeps where you feel like you're being watched. My little brother even remarked that he felt watched there and asked if we were sure nobody was in there while we were gone. Well, I noticed today that when I was there alone, my dog was acting very nervous and suspicious. She wasn't running around and playing like she usually does and she didn't want me to go to the backyard or wooded area. I trusted her and my gut feeling. I don't know if the thieves were there at that time, but I'm glad I didn't have to find out. We're currently in the process of installing cameras. This had to have been somebody that lives nearby us and can monitor how often we're there. Update. So we did catch a car pulling in like it was scoping the place out. The people inside never got out but they left. We asked a few of my fiancé's family members about it, and that was to our detriment. One of them went and spread the word that we have cameras, and somebody in the neighborhood who owned the vehicle that we caught on camera slipped up and said they already knew things had been stolen. This, to me, is basically a confession, because we hadn't told anybody about the robbery until the incident with the car we caught on camera. So now more people than necessary know and we probably won't catch the person who did it. We still turn the footage into the police, though. Maybe they can dig up some background info if we're lucky. The 
This might be a little bit long, but it still gives me nightmares. I'm a 21-year-old female. I drive from Miami to Daytona Beach near Orlando almost every other week. I make sure to fuel up before I start off, but this one day, this one most unfortunate day, I did not. I left Daytona around 12 a.m., driving back to Miami. I drive a black Mustang 40th anniversary. I was literally flooring it back home through the I-95. The entire route was pretty much empty, other than a few trucks and small cars here and there. I was jamming to some good music, not paying too much attention to what was going on with my fuel tank. Well, around 2.30 or 2.45 a.m., the low fuel warning popped up suddenly. I saw it and started looking for the nearest exit, which just so happened to be Boynton Beach. I've never been there, and I have no idea and still don't about how the area is. I took the exit and saw there was a Circle K right off of it. I felt a little bit relieved, because now at least I wouldn't run out of fuel smack dab in the middle of nowhere. With barely any fuel left in my car, I pulled up to this gas station. It was totally empty. I couldn't even see a single car inside or even outside on the road. There were no people, other than one tall man in a red-colored jacket, walking around near the side of the gas station store where all the parkings were. Fortunately, he was not very close to the pump I was at. I was a little bit scared by him, but I usually try to shake my fear off by telling myself that it's just nothing. The man at this point was looking at the ground, but began kind of walking in the general direction of my car. I was still inside, contemplating whether I should get out or stay inside. Usually, I would have just gotten out and fueled, not being scared at all. But that day, something in my gut told me to lock the door right away and wait inside until he either went away or walked past my car. As time continued on, the guy was now just a few feet away from my car, still not looking directly at me. I was trying to tell myself in my head, it's okay, he doesn't even care that I'm here. I should just get out and do my business. Just then, my worst fear came to life. This man looked straight up at me and dashed towards the driver's side door. He grabbed the handle and tried to open it. At this point, it was around 3 a.m. with no other people in the general vicinity. I literally froze for a second and thought I was going to die. He yanked the door handle several times, trying to get it open. Thankfully, I somehow managed to get my senses back. I turned the car on and floored it out of there. He didn't even let go of the door handle until I started the car and hit the gas pedal. I'm just thankful that despite the low fuel, my car still started up and drove off. I had nothing on me to defend myself. Not a single thing other than a plastic fork I got from Panda Express earlier that day. I still can't get over this whole experience. It just scares the living shit out of me. This is my first time posting here. This event happened in 2018. I worked at SeaTac Airport, which I think is probably still the smallest international airport I've ever seen. The airport was so small that your workstation almost forces you to work alongside with other jobs. In this case, I worked in sales, and we were stationed next to the wheelchair lane, which usually had one wheelchair pusher at a time. Now keep in mind, I was only 19 years old when this incident happened. I would say I'm a sweet person who goes out of my way to start conversations with people that looked bored, since I worked night shifts at the airport. There was practically nobody flying, and there would be more workers around than passengers. Therefore, we meet Mike, around the age of 20 to 23. Mike was one of the wheelchair pushers who looked completely out of it, zoned out, didn't seem very talkative. Me and Mike worked side by side in the lanes. He would usually come to give the person in the wheelchair lane a lunch break and then proceed to go back to pushing people in wheelchairs throughout the airport. The 30 minutes we saw each other every day was completely awkward and quiet until one day he overheard me and my co-workers conversation about depression. He propped his chair up and said, 
Yeah, I agree with you. Depression really sucks. And that's when I realized, oh man, this kid doesn't just look depressed, but probably is himself. Now, I didn't know how that small interaction changed our perspective on Mike. He would join our conversation and even went out of his way to say hello and give us a hug while he finds us throughout the airport. One day, my lead suggested Mike and I should go out for tacos, since we both kept complaining how nothing opens late at night and we were always hungry. I'd known Mike for almost a month now, and his depression-filled body started filling with joy every time we would find out we were stationed next to each other. At this rate, we laughed it off, saying, No way, it would be too weird if we went alone together. He looked at me and said, You know, I actually know this amazing Mexican spot that's nearby if you're actually hungry. They serve the best fish tacos. Now, knowing the fat ass I am, I did not decline. I loved eating late at night, and Mike never gave me stranger danger vibes. I agreed because I didn't see the harm in going out to get tacos before I conked out. We exchanged our numbers, and I headed home before him, since I clocked out an hour before he does. When I arrived home, I was getting dressed to go eat out. The plan was just to meet up at the spot since the Mexican spot ended up being only five minutes away from my house. I got a text from Mike, saying he wants to pick me up. I kept refusing because I had just finally gotten my driver's license and the place was only five minutes away from my home. After almost 40 minutes of us insisting how we're going to get there, I finally gave in to have him pick me up, which I would later regret very much. I was a fairly big girl, like in the 200 zone compared to Mike, who was very thin and short, so I wasn't worried if he attempted anything with me. I told him to just pick me up along a street farther away because I didn't really want him to know where exactly I lived just yet. His beat-up trash Toyota pulled up, and we headed to the Mexican spot. We got our food. It was actually pretty amazing. So amazing we went for seconds, and had a good talk watching the soap opera on the TV. After we were done, we get back into his car, where he was supposed to drop me off back at home. He looked over it to me and said, can we talk in private? I know a good spot. I kindly refused and told him it was already 2 a.m. and we should just get back home. I know it's late, but I just have a lot going on in my life and you're the only person that's really hung out with me like this. Being the kind of idiot I am, I said sure. Already seeing him drive down the road he did, I noticed so many red flags. The streetlights started to disappear and his mood and tone started to change. There was a completely different atmosphere around Mike that emerged. He started telling me all these things. I sure do hate the society about women nowadays. They all have this stupid standard. I hate them. I hate them. I was very startled. Did I just find a woman hater? Mike never rubbed me off as that kind of guy. He just started to scream every time he attempted to talk to women, they would blatantly reject him. And me, a woman, was now a dummy he was projecting all his female hate talk onto. I was actually too stunned to speak, because he became a whole different person. We arrived at this abandoned skate park in the middle of God knows where. He told me to get out. I listened, and here we are at 2am, sitting on cold concrete in freezing temperatures. He goes on and tells me how he hates all women, and he would lie to his passengers he took in his wheelchairs and tell them he was from the UK. I was overwhelmed. What the fuck was happening right now? He then talked to me in this British accent from there on how he would give his life up for God, and God was the only thing keeping him chained down. He looked me dead in the eyes and said, God would want me to castrate myself since he doesn't want me touching or being near a female creature for my safety. I was completely quiet the whole time, confused, questioning how much of a fool I was to even think that I thought this guy liked me. I was completely wrong. After 30 minutes, I was getting cold, since being this female creature I was, I was anemic. I told him I would like to go home now. He simply told me, no. I felt like I was in a movie, because I couldn't believe what was happening. After he noticed I was shaking my leg, he then said, I guess we can proceed back to the car at least. When we got back to his car, a miracle happened. My mother decided to call me just then. 
I was expecting her to scream at me, asking where I was and to come home like she usually does, but this time she just spoke in a calm voice. Where are you? She spoke in Vietnamese. I told her I was going out for food with a co-worker. She said, okay, have fun, and hung up. Again, in disbelief that she didn't care where I was at almost 3 a.m. for the first time in forever, I did a little bit of a lie. What? Oh, you want me to come home right now? Oh, okay, I'll start heading there right now. I pretended to hang up the phone. I looked at Mike and said, Sorry, my mom wants me home right now. He began beating the wheel and sighed this annoyingly loud sigh, which gave me a jump scare for a moment. He started his car and just sat there in silence, grinning the whole time. He eventually started driving and pulled out his phone and literally threw it at me. Open it, he said. Already exhausted and still not believing everything that was happening, my eyes grew fixated on the over 100 notes in his phone. What is this? I asked. He said it was songs and poems he wrote. He looked at me. Go ahead, pick one. I don't remember what the notes said exactly. Only keywords I saw were betrayal and woman that stood out. Ah, that one. Would you like me to sing it for you? I straight up said no. He continued to sing it for me anyway. The worst part was he was singing it in this fake British accent. The whole drive he was just singing me about how God's plan was to stray him from the human race so he could overcome himself. I was zoned out. It didn't feel real, almost like a dream. My sense of danger got lower due to how exhausted I was. I was listening to this man who wanted to eradicate the female species off the face of the earth and how our judgment day was coming. He dropped me off on my street and even had the audacity to say, I had such a lovely time with you, darling. I slammed his door shut and ran down my street before he had a chance to start up his car. After this whole incident, I ignored his messages, which he texted me two pages long how he was sorry and how he believed God was there to put us together. How my Asian-ness was the only thing holding him back from committing real love to me. I stood in the back of my station to avoid talking to him. He would follow me back to my break room. Thankfully, my manager was there and yelled at him to piss off before he called security. Eventually, he did get the hint that I was not interested, but instead, he started to steer me down every second he was in the same station with me. Thankfully, during that time, I found a second job, and my whole schedule was changed. I never had to see him at work again after that. I saw him once at Target, but I quickly ran back to my car before he even had the chance to walk up to me. I later found out Mike was living with one of my lesbian co-workers on their couch. I told her everything he said and did. She was completely shocked. She had never seen Mike like that. He was just a very quiet boy who would crack a joke here and there. I advised her to keep a close eye on him. She thanked me for relaying on the information, and eventually he was forced to move out later in the month. A little bit of background, I, 23 and female, was 20 at the time this happened. I moved in with my uncle in San Antonio, Texas, with the agreement that I didn't have to pay rent as long as I helped him out with chores and my cousins. I got a job at a super well-known coffee chain downtown, close to the touristy part of the area. We had a lot of regulars and a lot of homeless coming in and out as well. I felt relatively safe, though, because I got to know the people there, and it was almost always a lot of foot traffic around as well. I used to even take walks after work in the area, especially since I was super close to the river walk. Skipped to a couple months into the job, and I was pretty much friends with everyone I worked with. We were all super close. On this particular day, it was one of my co-workers' last days there, there were about three guys who had been in there almost all morning. They hadn't bought anything and were just hanging out. It wasn't too unusual for my location. On my break, I decided to walk down to a nearby drugstore so I could get a farewell card and maybe also a small gift for said co-worker. I walked out and put my earphones in. 
Before I could even press play, I heard the door open up behind me, and footsteps following behind. Whoever it was caught up to me and started walking alongside me, matching my pace exactly. I turned to look. It was one of those guys that had been there all morning. He was a bit taller than me and reminded me a lot of Lakeith Stanfield. He tried to ask for my number. I kindly told him no. He persisted and I with a short temper kind of told him to fuck off. He stopped and stared at me in surprise as I don't look like someone who speaks up or would be rude. He just stood there and watched as I walked away and by the time I went back they were already gone. I proceeded to tell my co-workers about the encounter and we all laughed it off together. I thought that would be the end of it. Of course, I was wrong. Every single shift after that, he would already be there just hanging out or would walk in mid-shift, sometimes with somebody else and sometimes by himself. I just assumed he was another homeless person due to how he was pretty much always able to be around. My shifts were sporadic as well. Some days I opened, some days I closed, sometimes I worked mid, but it didn't matter when I worked. He was always there. At that point, I started feeling a bit paranoid. I would always catch him staring in my direction. He would never order anything either, never talk to me, wouldn't follow me either. He would just sit there for hours watching me. I started mentioning it to my coworkers, and they started noticing it too. One of my team leaders would help me out by sending me to wash dishes in the back or organize the cooler. My co-workers would also try and place themselves to try and block me from his view. I started feeling very uncomfortable at work. Sometimes when I closed, a co-worker would walk me to my car before heading home themselves. Or if I didn't close, they would walk me to my car and turn around and head back to work. Suddenly, one day he was just staring same as usual. I was working the register that day. When he walked up and ordered a water... I asked for his name for his order. I now had his first name, just in case. He took his water and went and sat back down. I had mentioned him before to my manager, but because he hadn't really done anything yet, we couldn't do anything beside note it in the manager book. The next day, I worked with my manager. It was him, two other co-workers, and me. I told them I had to go to the bathroom real quick. There were two bathrooms right next to each other but sort of hidden from the coffee bar and register. They weren't gender specific either. I walked around the bar to the lobby area. I had to pass his table and walk down the lobby to get to the bathrooms. I noticed him getting up just as I went inside. I sat down to do my business. When someone began to rattle the knob, I shouted that it was occupied, but whoever it was kept rattling the door until I was finished. When I finally opened the door, no one was there but I did notice him walking back and adjusting his chair. I was super freaked out and told my boss. He couldn't tell him anything because we had no direct proof it was him. Later that shift, he got up and picked up a coffee from the pickup area. My boss assumed he had ordered it and let him take it. I told him it wasn't, and it wasn't even his real name. My boss used this as an opportunity to tell him if he did something like that again, he would never be allowed to come back. The man apologized profusely, and after that he actually stuck to the rules very strictly. He went back to just watching me. Cut to Valentine's Day. One of my team leaders and I would be scheduled to work certain Thursdays after close to deep clean the store. We would stay until 1am. This happened to be one of those Thursdays. We were almost done, and I just had to clean the bathrooms as one of the last chores. I finished. And as I walk out of the bathroom, I saw him peeking in with both his hands pressed against the window, eyes wide, just staring at me with this super intense look. I froze for a second, just staring back. I noticed on one of his palms, pressed against the window, a purple foam heart. He didn't move at all. I freaked out and went back into the bathroom. I shouted, Hannah, Hannah, he's here, he's back! She barely hears me through the music we were blasting. Hannah was the team lead who would help hide me from him, 
so she knew the huge fear I had towards him. She walked towards the bathroom, shouting back, What are you saying? What's going on? As soon as she tried to approach, though, she saw him staring through the window. I told her again, He's here. He's watching me. She started shouting through the window, You need to leave. If you don't leave, we're calling the police right now. I stepped out a little to see if he'd leave on his own. Instead, he was ignoring her, and his eyes were fixated on me. I stepped back into the bathroom, and my lead continued to shout at him to leave. About five minutes passed when he realized I was not stepping out of that bathroom again until he left, so finally he gave up. The next day, my lead and I told my manager I wanted to file a police report. He told me to wait until he talked to his boss. He showed up again that day, but I was only there to talk to my manager and leave right after. When I got home, a friend convinced me to call the cops. I texted my boss that I didn't care what he or his boss said. I was scared and I was going to file a report. I dialed 911 and told them a summarized version. They told me they were going to send someone to where I lived to take the official report. The two officers were very nice and super supportive. I told them my whole story and how my boss didn't feel the need to get cops involved since I hadn't been harmed yet. The officers told me I should have called them right away and defended me saying they could get him for harassment. I thanked them and they told me if he showed up to dial 911 so they could take him in for trespassing and harassing. I think that day my manager banned him and warned him because he never showed up to the coffee shop again. A few months later when I was comfortable again with downtown, I went out with some friends to walk around. We were close to where I worked. As we rounded a corner, I saw him. I ducked into a little corner store and my friends followed behind. I told them I'd seen him, and they kept an eye out. Once he was out of view, we left the store, and thankfully, that was the last time I saw him. I live in a small condominium in a very quiet area, in one of the biggest cities in France. My apartment is on the ground floor, at the very end of the building. In short, no one has to pass in front of my place, because to access the upper floors, it's done at the other end through the parking lot. However, at the very back of the residence, there's a common garden to which it's possible to access all floors. It's stupid. The path is longer and very muddy, but as it's possible, many newcomers use this path. I get along very well with four of my neighbors. We actually talk every day for several hours, to say the least. I have to take my dog out several times a day, and they usually keep me company. Now they even protect me. On October 18th, my neighbor confided to me to have seen someone passing in front of her window. As she's in the apartment before mine, the man would thus have passed at my place to reach the floors, so he passed on my ground as well. I don't want people I don't know to cross my property. It's my yard and it excites my dog as well. She just barks and disturbs the whole neighborhood. On October 20th, the man passed by my house while I was taking the dog out in the common garden with my neighbors. I kindly asked the man to not pass this way anymore and reminded him the proper way to reach the floors after he asked me if my dog was dangerous. He started screaming arms in the air, looked like an angry bear sort of. Horrific. He seemed crazy, and he yelled at me that he would send my dog to the shelter, that he could do whatever he wanted to, that he knew the common rules. After yelling one or two minutes, he left, mumbling to himself. We were upset, but we never thought he would try to get revenge. Here's the list with the days of all the surprises that he served me even though at the time we had no proof the actions were his. October 23rd, theft of two pairs of shoes I left outside. October 25th, my car was scratched and a tire deflated intentionally. October 28th, the theft of four of my garden chairs, my last pair of outdoor shoes, and stealing my doormat. October 29th, two intentionally deflated tires, and October 30th, the destruction of my mailbox lock, 
destruction of the padlock of my parking gate, and an attempt to destroy the lock on my front door. From that point on, I was terrified. Would I have to go back to live with my parents? I was afraid for my dog as well. She was everything to me, and had saved my life so many times. I filed a complaint with the police, and I didn't want to play his game. On October 30th, we installed a small camera, hidden in a plastic flower pot and dead leaves on my land between some bushes. We waited for one thing, to see him come back, to have proof for the police to identify clearly the man who was doing this. He had a very peculiar style. Maybe I could get my stuff back, if he hadn't already ruined it. And damn, those cameras were effective. It took several days before our camera, Eve, was filming more than just stray cats. Meanwhile, I was terrified at home, wondering if he was going to smash my car or try and poison my dog or something. I started to have panic attacks at work. Since I was late a couple of mornings when my tires were deflated, I also had to endure stupid remarks from my boss. It was just a lot of anxiety. On November 4th, Eve filmed the guy stealing two pairs of shoes I had left behind to lure him in. At that night, at 1 o'clock in the morning, he knocked over my ashtray all over my front porch. I got him. Fuck yeah! I was ecstatic! I could prove this was the same man who verbally abused me and was now fucking with my stuff. I immediately notified my neighbors, and in the morning, as she left for work, my neighbor saw him in the parking lot and took a picture of him. I can even compare it to the videos, so I can 100% prove it was him. I wouldn't let him hurt me or my baby. I went to the police this morning to show them the videos and make a joint complaint. Yesterday, Eve filmed him trying to break into my house. I'm afraid to be home alone. I don't sleep at night anymore. I'm afraid to leave my dog at the house alone. I think I'm going to move even though I was perfectly fine in this apartment. My mom wants me to get a lawyer, but I'm afraid of retaliation. This happened to me in 1970, when I was 11 and a half years old. My two brothers and I have always had to walk to and from grade school each day for eight years, since they didn't have a bus for our area. This was quite a distance away, and there's no way in current times there wouldn't have been a bus for our grade school days. We were the last house on the right in a very small subdivision on a dead-end street. Next to us was this ginormous cornfield with an old barn, a house, and a lot of acres of fruit trees and woods. As a shortcut, I would take this deserted woods trail and follow it to what will lead me to my house after about 15 minutes. This particular day, I turned right into the woods and the trail, as I had done every day every year for six years by this point. It was the end of winter, and I still had my long blue winter coat on. I'd walked about five minutes on the trail, and for some reason, I just happened to glance behind me. Quite some distance away, I could see a man enter the woods, on the same trail I was. No one else was around, and for some reason, I started walking faster. I tried to tell myself I was just being silly. When I looked behind me, though, I saw the man had also begun to pick up his pace. This scared me, and I started walking really fast. I saw he had increased his speed to match with me when I again glanced over my shoulder. I still don't know why. But that day, I felt so much fear, I began running. I noticed he too began running as well. I was really afraid, and no longer had the time to glance behind me. I broke into a full run as fast as I could, until I came out on the road in front of my house. Normally, I walk the trail a bit further and end up at our garage and back door. But that day, I sprinted into where our little street on the dead end began, and that brought me right in front of our house. I didn't want him to know exactly which house I lived in, so at that point I stopped to catch my breath. He was maybe only 10 to 15 seconds behind me. He finally caught up with me, but he didn't stop. He slowed to a much slower pace, looked at me and smiled, and said, You're a fast runner. 
Then he took off running again. I stayed where I was until I couldn't see him anymore, and then I turned into our driveway. For months after that, I would take a different way home, and did not walk those trails again for some time. I don't know if I was just being paranoid, but why else would a young man begin running after me for a good ten minutes like that? He scared the shit out of me. It was a good thing I was indeed a very fast runner. I don't know what might have occurred on that deserted woods trail. I was working at my first ever job in retail. I was around 20 years old. It was a busy morning, 9am, somewhere mid-December or so, hence why it was so busy. I was working the checkouts as per usual, scanning items, ringing up customers, all that jazz. It was about an hour into my shift. I was serving this elderly man who bought just a handful of items. After giving him his subtotal, another guy behind him smelling of booze, stretched out handing me cash. I kindly told him I wasn't serving him, I was serving the man in front of him. Then I looked down and saw he was buying some cheap knockoff branded Baileys, some booze, and of course, I figured this guy was wasted. Just as I was taking payment from the elderly man, I was planning in my head how on earth I was going to tell the next guy I could not sell him alcohol, as he was already far past drunk. This was my first job, so I had never encountered this sort of thing before. I finished serving the old man, and moved on to the drunk guy. I looked around in hopes to find another colleague or maybe even my manager, but no one in sight was available to help. I looked at the man. Just before I opened my mouth, I felt like someone grabbed a fistful of my hair and something sharp poked me in the back. A man whispered in my ear, to which I also smelt alcohol on his breath. Serve my mate. He pushed what I'm assuming was a knife harder into my back. Now! In complete shock, I said nothing. I just scanned the bottle, took the cash, and suddenly they were gone. I quickly turned around to my colleague working checkouts behind me, but all they did was look at me and ask if I was okay, completely unaware what just happened. I went for my break after this. I saw my manager pass by, so I rushed over to him and told him what just happened. All he did was laugh because he thought I was joking. He criticized me for selling alcohol to someone under the influence. Whatever that sharp object that was on my back was, it cut me. Before my break, I could feel blood running down my back, and I was very sore as well. Of course, the others couldn't see the blood as my uniform was black. I screamed to myself, It's true, it did happen! I turned around and lifted my hair, as I have very long hair. Lift up my shirt or get my female colleague to do it. This guy fucking sliced me, look. But the manager just said, Ew, no, I don't want to see you lift up your shirt. He walked away, staring at his phone. Well, I did not return to finish my shift. I snuck out of the store, took a taxi, and went home. My mom cleaned up my back and dressed it. Then the next morning she called work to tell them I would not be returning. She listed the manager's incompetence to take action when I could have almost been stabbed over a bottle as the reason. This is my first time posting here or anywhere about this incident, so I apologize if details get a little bit confusing. I'll try my best to make it as concise as possible. This happened a few months ago to my friends and I. We're university students in Cape Town, South Africa, so when we aren't trying to just get through the semester, we like to let our habits get the better of us and go out for some drinks. On this night in particular, we had just finished what felt like an extra long day at university and decided to head to a bar about five minutes away from campus for some much-needed stress relief. The evening was actually going well although a tad slow. It was enjoyable with everyone having a drink and getting a bit restless. Me being one of the more outgoing ones of the group, I suggested we head to the pool bar not far from where we were. Everyone agreed and we grabbed our stuff to go. 
we all jumped in my car, and we got to the bar. Being a Thursday night, though, parking was quite scarce. I finally managed to find a spot about a block away from the bar, but in this secluded side street. I should also mention that this bar is one of the sketchier parts of town. Normally, though, it's quite safe due to the sheer amount of nightlife associated with being so close to a university. We walked to the bar, and no one really felt uneasy, nor did anything happen to make us feel that way. It was quite surprising, actually. And after a few hours of some pool and just relaxing about, we decided it was about time to grab some dinner before the restaurants closed, as being in South Africa meant that most restaurants, even fast food, closed really early at around 7 or 8 p.m. to comply with the curfew. We decided to stop at the pizza place below the bar to grab some food, before we all decided what the plan for the end of the night was. So, because our group was so large and the pizza place being so small, we decided to have those getting food go inside, while the others who didn't would just wait outside on the street. This was an easy decision, as the pizza place had a massive open window, so we could still all talk to each other. This is where things started getting a little bit weird, though. While we were waiting for our friends inside the pizza place to come out, this massive white van pulled up past us and stopped. The driver wasn't a particularly intimidating-looking dude. In fact, he was quite skinny, and looked to be about average height with shoulder-length long blonde hair. A pretty standard-looking dude, at least for the kind of area we were in. He called out to me, and asked if I thought his van could fit in a parking spot just behind him. For perspective, this parking spot could probably fit like a small hatchback, maybe. This dude was driving a full, long-size panel van. This made me kind of uneasy, as I thought that as a driver of that sort of car, you should definitely know where your car can and cannot fit. This was one of those situations. I kindly explained to him that I didn't think it would even be worth attempting. He responded telling me that he had faith in his ability, and I should come stand behind the van to direct him. This gave me major red flags. After a few back and forths, he just pulled the emergency brake up and sat and stared at my friends and I for what felt like an eternity. He then thanked us suddenly and drove off. This sparked my friends to come outside from the pizza place, as they just saw what had happened and were very confused. We were all kind of weirded out, but thought nothing of it. Everyone just ate their pizza, and we tried to decide what the plan was for the last hour or two we have, before the curfew cut things short. Most of us decided this is where the night was going to end, as we were all kind of weirded out by that guy in the van. A few others decided they were going to stay, and just uber home a little bit later in the evening. With our group number now cut down to four, we decided to walk back to the car and just drive home. When we left the pizza place, this homeless person called out to us, insisting we had nothing to worry about with the guy in the van. This did not help anyone's nerves. We then decided to head to the car, but as soon as we turned the corner to approach the side street where it was parked, we saw that van man again this time not looking quite so happy as he had seemed in his earlier encounter. I made a cheeky comment about him finally finding a parking spot he could fit in while we were walking past each other. He just stared at my friends and I, not breaking eye contact even when we passed him by. I turned around to see if he was still looking. He was, but as we turned the corner to the side street with the car, I saw it, and my heart sank. The van horribly parked half on and half off the sidewalk, back door slightly open. Upon seeing this, I turned around and saw Van Man was now walking towards us. He said something that confused me at first, but immediately made sense after. He called out, Hey, please just watch my car. This confused me. When he said that, though, four men sat up from leaning on the wall next to it and began to follow us. My friends and I were slightly ahead of them, so we were trying to discuss the game plan. It was obvious if we did nothing, something horrible was going to happen. My friends started walking faster, and I remained at the same speed, frantically searching for my car keys, all while shouting at my friends to wait up and asking what the rush was. 
This was all in hopes that the guys behind us who were gaining on us were oblivious to us knowing they had sinister intentions. As soon as the car came into view, we booked it. We jumped in and drove away, but we were only seconds away from being not that lucky. After locking the car doors, I saw the four men surrounding the car. I managed to get us out of this, but looking back in the mirror, I saw a fifth man by the van at the bottom of the street. I still have no idea what their intentions were that night, if it was to rob us, beat us up, or worse. I don't really like to think about how lucky we were that night. I ask that when you're out, no matter how innocent an interaction with someone can seem, always pay attention to the little things. When I was 18, I worked at my college's residence building at the front desk. I think I almost got assaulted or murdered. You be the judge. During the summer, the building operated as a hotel, so two and a half floors were hotel rooms, and half of the third floor were student dorms. The whole building operated with this hotel swipe key system that was pretty outdated, honestly. All the doors were powered by four AA batteries. If the batteries died, it was a decently lengthy process to replace them and reprogram the door. A dark-haired guy came to the front desk from inside the building while I was working an overnight shift at around 1 or 2 a.m. He told me he'd left his key card in his room. I made him a new one and made my first error of the night. A hotel guest could have as many room keys remade as they wanted, hypothetically at least. Students, however, were supposed to be given a temporary key card and charged $2 to be returned when theirs was located. I gave him a new key for his room and asked if he was a student or a hotel guest. He replied immediately, student. At this point, I should have checked our system to charge his account, but I was caught up in doing administrative duties and I forgot to do it in the moment. I used to trust people way too easily at this job, but after this, I quickly learned not to. Later on that night, maybe around 3 or 4 a.m., he came back to the desk again and said he could not get into his room. I asked if he'd just forgotten his key again. He said no, the door was not working. I asked if the light was coming on when he swiped his card. He said no, so I figured the batteries were probably just dead. I told him I'd have to change the batteries and went up to his room with him. He asked for my name, and I told him. He never told me his. I opened the room door manually with a master key and told him I'd have to prop it open while I worked on the back panel to replace the batteries. No, 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 no. It's okay. I'll close it, he said, and closed and dead bolted the door. It was a really weird interaction, but I tried not to think too much about it. I had changed the batteries on plenty of other doors by this point and some students were iffy about having their doors propped open for their room to be on display for anyone walking by. The man also had this really thick accent. I thought he might be an international student, since we had lots of students from other countries where English was not their first language. I gave him the benefit of the doubt in that moment and thought maybe it was just a language barrier issue. At this point, though, I was starting to feel like something was really wrong. I tried to ignore it so I didn't freak him out too much. While I was there trying to focus on fixing the door as quickly as possible, he kept trying to coax me to go further into the room, saying his bed was broken and he needed me to take a look at it. There was something underneath that needed to be fixed, etc. He held out this little gold house key and said, I have a key, go get it, and threw it under the bed. He also said there was a leak under the fridge. He just kept trying to get me down on the ground, throwing random problems at me. Obviously, I told him no to all of these. I told him I'd send maintenance in the morning to take a look at it if anything was truly broken. I had my back to him at this point, and he asked me if I would take off my glasses. I told him no and that I needed them to see. His tone of voice immediately changed. In the most steady, chilling manner, he said, Ella, it's okay. You can take them off. From behind me, he reached around and tried to take off my glasses. I swatted his hand away and tried to remain calm. 
Even though he was creeping me the fuck out, I didn't want to be rude to him, and I still had to do my job anyway. I didn't want to get in trouble if he complained about me, or risk upsetting him and having him yell at me or something. I got up to grab something from the door repair kit, and undid the door deadbolt. I opened it up in the process. He jumped toward the door to close it once again, and told me to keep it closed. I told him no, I had to open it to start reprogramming it from the front. While I held the door open with my foot, and grabbed something from the door repair kit, he started playing with the little wispy hairs at the top of my forehead, and trying to touch my shoulder. I swatted him away again and asked him not to touch me, and focused on just getting the fuck out of there. He once again tried getting me to follow him into the room. I went as far as the door frame to see if I could actually spot any problems with his room. That's when I realized that he had nothing in his room. No dishes in the kitchen, no shower curtain in the bathroom, no sheets on the bed, nothing. This wasn't his room. My brain once again went back to the international student theory, thinking he might have just arrived today and hadn't gotten a chance to buy anything yet. But in the pit of my stomach, I knew something was wrong. I fiddled around with the door for a few more seconds before announcing that it was fixed, and quickly gathered the door kit and left. Before I had even reached the elevator, he came back out without his shoes on to follow me. He tried to get back in to get his shoes, and called out, Ella, the door isn't fixed. You need to come back right now. I went back and opened the door manually. I told him if the door was broken, I'd have to send up maintenance to fix it in the morning. I already knew he was going to follow me to the elevator again, so I closed the door behind me once he went inside, and ran down the stairwell as fast as I could. When I got to the front desk, I immediately checked the computer, and saw the room he was supposed to be in was empty. It wasn't a student room or a hotel room. I locked myself in our back office, and called campus security. He came down a few minutes later and walked behind the desk. I yelled at him to get on the other side and wait. Now that I knew he wasn't a residence, he tore the corner off a slip of paper I had sitting on the desk and drew a flower on it. When security arrived, he ran back up to the empty room and tried convincing them he lived there so he wouldn't have to leave. He kept showing them his key, which had decided to work on the door again somehow. They escorted him back downstairs and came to ask me if he really did live there. Obviously, he fucking didn't. That's why I called you guys crying and terrified. He kept interjecting to argue that he did live there, but couldn't even recall his room number when asked. Security asked him for a student card, and he couldn't produce it, so they told him he would have to leave if he couldn't prove he lived there. While they were grabbing his information, I listened from the office and could immediately tell he was lying. The phone number he gave was just a bunch of random numbers off the top of his head. The name he gave was prefixed by a long, um, as if he was trying to think of one on the spot. When they asked him for his address, he said just across the street. The security guard asked him if he lived in the apartments across the street. He said yes, but couldn't tell them what the building number was. Eventually, he said the number was 1,200, but I moved into that building a few months later, and that apartment does not exist. When security asked what his purpose was to be sneaking into a room, he just kept the ums and uhs and saying he didn't know. As they further questioned him, he just kept fidgeting and started saying, I don't know, no reason, I was just here. At one point, he even tried to tell them he was my friend, at which point I poked my head out of the office to say I'd literally never seen him before that night. He left. We didn't call the police because he didn't actually do anything but it was still fucking unsettling. Later on, it dawned on me how he figured out that room was vacant. One of the housekeepers had been using it as her personal break room. A few days later, a housekeeper came to the desk and told me they found the door dead bolted open, the TV on, and a housekeeper inside watching TV. She must have forgotten to close the door when she left for the night, and when the creep let himself into the building, he found that empty room. I never saw him again, and to this day, I have no clue what he was doing there. I haven't worked there since last winter, and overnight shifts still give me the heebie-jeebies. This is a story that happened to me when I was in college, around 19 or 20. 
Some details are a little bit fuzzy, as it's been over a decade now, but I'll do my best to recount it as accurately as possible. It's also relevant to mention I have always looked very young for my age, to the point where someone asked if I was lost and looking for my mom once when I was at the bank depositing a check as a 20-year-old. Anyone passing me on the street at the time likely thought I was a preteen or a young teen. I'm also very small and short. In general, I just look like an easy target, and like someone who wouldn't be able to put up a good fight. It was the middle of the afternoon, and I was home from college for the weekend, driving home from an auto shop having just picked up my car after some repairs. It suddenly started making a loud grinding noise. This car was very old, so things were always going wrong with it. I pulled into a shopping center parking lot and called my parents for advice on whether I should take it back to the shop or get a tow. I knew very little about cars. My mom told me she would come meet me at the shopping center and we'd figure it out together. At this point, my phone battery was also dying, so I shut my phone off after that call. As I was hanging out in the parking lot, a guy pulled over on the street in front of me, rolled down his window, and asked me for directions. I did my best to direct him, but instead of taking off, he then pulled into the parking lot and got out of the car. I remember thinking that was weird, but like many a young women, I'd been socially conditioned to be nice and helpful, so I ignored the slight alarm that was going off inside my head. After all, it was broad daylight in the middle of a shopping center. Cars were driving by constantly. It's not like it was nighttime in the middle of an abandoned alley or something. The guy started to make what seemed like small talk, and I complied, not understanding what he wanted. He introduced himself, asked my name, I offered him my first name. He asked what I did. I said I was a student studying art. He asked where I went to school and I told him. He asked how old I was. Then he asked my sign. I should note that my mom was very into astrology at the time, so this didn't strike me as a weird question. She was always asking people for their birth date and time and offering to do their charts and whatnot. I told him my sign, and he replied, Oh, no way, me too. My birthday is X. When is yours? I foolishly told him, again thinking this guy was just really into astrology like my mom. He made a little more small talk, and then, I guess seeing that I was a bit more relaxed, he said he was a sculptor that if I was interested in art, I'd love the sculptures he had at his home. He said we could go there right now and look at them. Immediately, that dull alarm in the back of my head got turned way up. I was young and naive, but I knew never to get into a stranger's car and immediately felt uncomfortable. Keep in mind, as I mentioned earlier, I looked extremely young, though he knew how old I was at this point. I started to put two and two together. He was getting increasingly more insistent that I get in his car and go to his house right now. He reached for my arm, and at that point everything is a blur. I yelled that I had to go, and ran from my own car into the nearest store. It was this tiny game store, so there wasn't really anywhere to hide. I told the cashier about the guy though, and asked if I could wait in there until my mom showed up. And the cashier kindly assured me the man would not be let into the store and that he and his co-worker would keep an eye on me until the man was gone. I also asked them if I could use their phone to call my mom and let her know what was going on since mine had died. I kept watching the guy outside by my car, worried he would try to come in, but as soon as he saw me use the store's phone, he jumped in his car and bolted off. I wish the story ended there. That whole encounter got me really shook up, but as I reflected on it, I realized... Through the questions the man had asked, he had my first name, the exact birth date, and he also knew where I went to school. I asked a friend of mine what kind of info he could get based on what he had, and much to my distress, my friend showed me he was able to find out my full name, my phone number, and my home address with the info I had given the man. I felt like such an idiot. I had always been taught to be wary of strangers and not give them personal info. I was baffled by how easily this guy had gotten this info out of me just by pretending to have casual conversation. Nothing happened for a few weeks and I started to stress less. I stopped thinking about the encounter and stopped worrying about running into the man again. Then one early morning, 
My cell phone rang. The number was restricted, a caller ID block. I answered. There was heavy breathing on the phone, but no reply. I hung up. It happened again the next morning. This time, a man answered. What are you doing right now? He said. I was trying to sleep. What are you wearing? I immediately hung up. The calls continued, though. The next time I picked up, I told him if he called again, I'd call the police. I got a few more calls from a restricted number after that, but I stopped answering, and eventually they stopped altogether. I'm not entirely sure if the calls were from the man I met in the parking lot, but it seems pretty likely. It was just too much of a coincidence that they started right after that encounter. I spent a good year of being afraid of that man, and the memory still gives me chills when I think about it over a decade later. I've had plenty of encounters with creeps on the street, but none of them scared me as much as this, and none that I felt came close to actual danger as this either. I still can't believe how foolish I was giving him info about myself so easily. It was an important lesson in how smooth and sneaky creeps can be, and now I'm much more careful about what I say to strangers. I don't know what he had planned if I'd been foolish enough to actually get into his car with all those people around, but I'm glad that I never had to find out. I'm sorry if this isn't the right sub for this. This happened yesterday, and I still can't believe it happened. I'm still pretty freaked out. I'll explain it all at the end, so I'm sorry if it gets a bit confusing as I'm telling it. I recently moved into a new flat, three weeks, and I'm sharing it with my sister. The only person we know properly is a single mom who lives in the apartment next door to us. Ever since we moved in, she's been giving us advice and helping us out with most things. We don't know anyone else properly yet. From what we've seen of our other neighbors, they're mostly couples in their 30s to 40s, or older guys who live alone. We're probably the youngest ones here. We're both females. I'm 18, and my sister is only 16. Today, I was out with friends, and then later on, I went to the gym. I then went to get my sister to go out for some food. We finally got back at around 10 p.m. The only people we saw on our way to the flat was the couple who lived next door to us. I didn't see anyone else. Me and my sister got into our pajamas and were just sitting around watching TV when suddenly our buzzer rang. I jumped up to answer it and it turned out to be the next door neighbor, the single mom. I asked her what was up, and she said that our dad was asking for us downstairs. Straight away, my stomach dropped, and I immediately asked her if she was sure he said he was our dad. The reason I asked her was just to make sure that's what she actually said. She replied that, yes, he was our dad, and he was looking for us. The neighbor asked me if she could let him up to our flat, but I told her right away not to do that. I wanted to call out to my sister, but I didn't want to make her worried. I asked the neighbor to not let him come up yet, and I heard her repeat this to him. I couldn't hear anything for a few minutes, and after this I started to get really worried. At this point my sister comes up to me and asks who it is. I started to feel really anxious, and I called out to my neighbor a few times. It must have only been about five minutes but it honestly felt like ages when she didn't reply. I was actually about to tell my sister to call the police, when eventually she told me that the man was gone. She came up to our flat and explained to us what went down. She said that she was walking to her flat after finishing work, when she saw a man waiting by the buzzers. At first, she assumed he was just someone who lived there, until he noticed her walking up. He asked for us by name, and if she could let him up to our flat. Obviously, she asked him who he was, and he told her that he was our dad. Obviously, she buzzed us and told us first, as our neighbor doesn't know us that well, and she doesn't know what our dad looks like at all. She said that because we were young, she didn't want to buzz in a strange man up to our flat. She said her mother instincts kicked in when she heard my hesitation to let him up. Apparently, after he heard me say that, 
he got really pushy with her and started trying to shove her out of the way. He kept on saying to her, It's okay. I'm their dad. Just let me in. I'm not going to do anything. She started arguing with him and asking him to tell her his name, but he refused. She told him that if I didn't feel comfortable letting him in, there was no way he was getting in. His reaction was to call her a bitch and then get in the car and drive away. This is the reason why I hesitated. We haven't spoken to our dad at all since I was 16. We even considered getting restraining order from him at one point. He's not our biological father, but we were legally adopted by him when I was nine. He was physically and verbally abusive to our mom, and had started to do the same with me. It got to the point where we had to leave him in the middle of the night. After this, he became very controlling, and would secretly record us. He has a criminal record as well, and I believe he was convicted of manslaughter in the 80s. I have no idea of the backstory behind that, and honestly, I don't even want to know. Like I said, we haven't heard from him since, so as soon as she said the word dad, I almost had a panic attack. I had asked her to describe him, but she said that because it was so dark out, she couldn't really see him. We ended up staying with her, because my sister and I were very shaken up. I don't know whether to call the police or not. I also don't know if it's our dad or not, as it could easily be someone else. I appreciate any advice. This situation still gives me chills to this day. Now, I live in a sketchy part of the neighborhood, but I had never had a job outside other than helping my mom. I was very naive and gullible at the time. I was fresh out of high school and looking for a job. I had worked with my mom junior to senior year cleaning houses, but I wanted to work somewhere else and gain some outside experience. When I graduated high school, my mom and I decided it was time to look for another job because I needed some money for college. My mom loved to read newspapers, and we would get a Spanish newspaper called Mundo Hispanico every week. I would look through it once in a while to read the comics or to read the job ads at the end. One evening, I was so determined to find an ad that paid well and was something else that would give me another set of work skills. I was going through the classification section at the end of the newspaper when I found what I thought would be the perfect job for me. I don't remember word for word, but it said something along the lines of looking for young females ages 18 to 25 for an open massage position at this location. The location they gave was 0.3 miles away from where I stayed so I thought it was perfect. I could walk to and from without having to worry about transportation since we only had one car. The massage training would be provided and the pay was handsomely good. Our girls earn anywhere from $500 to $900 a week. I thought, whoa, what a great wage. I can pay off my college in no time. I was so excited that I fit the profile that I showed my mom the job ad. My mom wasn't excited like I was. She had told me that it looked a little suspicious. I should call first to see if there really was another person on the other side. So I did call, and a lady answered. I asked about the free training, how much we really would make, and where the location was exactly. She seemed very sweet on the phone and told me before we could move forward they were doing interviews. They already had other candidates on their list. She said that I could come in for an interview to see if I would make it to the second round of interviews. I agreed. She gave me the address and I looked it up. When I saw it was .3 miles away from my apartment, I was extremely happy. I told my mom that I would be going to the interview at a set time, at this location and alone. She told me there was no way I would be going alone, and that she would come with me. I was mad. I wanted to do this by myself without having her help me. In my little mind, I thought I was all grown up, and didn't need any more help from her. 
The day came, and she drove us there in the only car we had. This address the lady gave me was weird, because it took us to a motel behind the shopping plaza that was next to our apartment. It didn't make sense to me why they would have an interview there, so we just circled the plaza looking for the place. My mom got frustrated and told me to just call the woman for the exact location. I did, and she told me that they were in motel room XXX, and that they were there because it was a safety precaution. It seemed to make sense to me. I told her I still couldn't find the place, so I asked if she could speak to my mother and tell her exactly where this place was. You're with your mother? This time, her voice changed from sweet to an almost angry and panicking tone. I said yes, I'm with her right now because she's driving me. I passed the phone to my mom. She said hello three times or so, but the lady had already hung up on her. I called two more times, but she never picked up the phone. I was mad that the lady had just hung up, and so we went back home. I never put two and two together until about three years after. I heard on the news that there was a newspaper job ad that had been busted, and the people were charged with human trafficking. The ad was very similar to the one I had read years ago. I thanked my mom over and over, because if it wasn't for her, I could have been dead or have been trafficked multiple times. I don't know where I would have ended up at. I'm so grateful for my mom, despite me being angry at her for coming with me, because if it wasn't for her, I wouldn't be where I am today. This one is long, however, I feel I should mention most of my interactions with this guy to show how normal someone can appear and how little things can all add up. I've written and rewritten this so many times, and the fact I've not been able to post twice kind of makes me feel like it's a sign that maybe I shouldn't. But here we go, anyways. I dated two guys at university. One, Nick, lasted a few months. The other, well, it was literally just one date. Before I begin... I must say that I was a little naive, shy, and riddled with anxiety. I mean, I knew enough about the world and wasn't sheltered or anything, but when it comes to male intentions towards me, I had low self-esteem and couldn't understand why anyone would be interested in me in that way. I assumed all guys were just being friendly. Anyway, this second guy, Dave, I met during my first year at university. He was nice enough. We met in a language class I had decided to take as an extra, and he smiled and chatted to me for a while. Honestly, now I think back, I do remember meeting him that day, but I soon forgot about him over the course of the year. One day, towards the end of the first year, he came up to me calling my name, which I was a bit surprised at to be honest. We hadn't spoken much since the first class and I didn't even remember his name. He asked me if we had any homework from another class, a class I didn't even know he was in. I remembered feeling a bit confused both that he knew my name and had seen me in a completely different class I hadn't even noticed him in, but I got over it and politely smiled. I said we didn't. We talked a bit about how we were going to spend our summers, and that was that. At the very end of the year... Our class had a night out drinking, and he was there. My housemate, myself, he and his friend, all went to a club afterwards. He proceeded to keep buying me drinks. I didn't really notice much, as he was also buying his friend drinks. But at one point, I declined more, saying I didn't want any more. He still bought me a drink, which I drank so as to not appear rude. He dropped my housemate and I off at home. Probably not the best decision to get into a car with a guy who had been drinking, but I was young and stupid. We all said goodbye. At some point over that summer, I was abroad, and I remember randomly getting a Facebook request from him. There was nothing abnormal at this point about his Facebook. 
He seemed like a typical student doing student things. I accepted, and gradually he began to add all of my online accounts. During my second year, I dated Nick, and I didn't see Dave at all until the end of that year. By this time, I had broken up with the other guy, and Dave asked me to go see a movie with him. I accepted since he was a nice guy, and he picked me up. We saw the movie, and he dropped me off again. Nothing weird. I thanked him, and he left. We really only talked during the drive there and back, and I began to talk about where I grew up. Now that I think back, though, he never divulged any information about himself, other than that he had already been married once. I had honestly not realized he was much older than me. He had quite a young face, but he never divulged his real age. It wasn't until much later I found this information out. The next night, he invited me over to his place. However, I declined, telling him that, honestly, I didn't think there could be anything more than friendship between us. He seemed to be fine with this, and we went back to being friends. This is where things start to get weird. At the end of the final year, I was due to turn 21. We were having a big party back in my hometown. I invited him along with some more of my friends from university. He contacted me and apologized, since he wouldn't be able to make it. He offered to take me out to dinner that evening as an early birthday present. I accepted. We went out, ate, and he offered to walk me home. All the way home, he kept commenting that I lived way out of town. It was a 30-minute walk to university, and 20 minutes into the city, which isn't that long at all. I told him this, but he just kept commenting about how far from campus I lived. The house my three housemates and I lived in was in a suburban area, and not exactly rural or anything. I was confused by this. He really made it seem like I lived miles away. Eventually, we got there, and me, being my typical naive self, invited him in. I felt bad he had walked out of his way to walk me home. Two of my roommates were in bed but one was still up watching TV. The three of us chatted for a while before it started to get later and later. My friend and I started dropping hints for him to leave, but he just wouldn't. We said we were tired and he would just keep talking, somehow always moving the conversation towards sex. It must have been about 3 or 4 a.m. before my housemate, who was a lot bolder than me, finally stood up and told him we were going to bed. He had to leave. For years, we thought he just didn't get the hints and was extremely dense. But that was only until a few months ago. Fast forward, and I haven't spoken to him in years. At some point, he blocked me on Facebook, because we got into a heated debate about politics around three years ago. A few months ago, a friend sent me a news article with a comment. Hey, didn't this guy go to university with us? Sure enough, there was a picture of Dave. The article? It's about how he was on trial, accused of raping multiple women around the time I knew him at university. It also stated that he was almost twice the age of the students at that university at the time. A mature student. And the judge had branded him as a dangerous man. Looking back that night, he was reluctant to leave, and that suddenly made a lot more sense. I'll forever be thankful to my housemate for not leaving me alone with him in our living room. I'm selfishly happy I never had the experience those girls did, but my heart goes out to them. I don't know the outcome of the trial, but little things, the hanging around, the constant attempts to turn conversations sexual, the secrecy about himself, buying drinks after I had already declined, it all points to the same thing in my mind. Suddenly then, I noticed that he still followed me on Twitter. Out of morbid curiosity, I decided to take a look. It hadn't been used for a long time, but there was a link to another account he had. One that sickened me. It contained incoherent ramblings about how women were terrible, getting more and more aggressive with each tweet. It quite frankly made me feel sick.
Two years ago, when my autistic daughter had trouble sleeping at night, she was one and a half at the time, I would toss her in a car seat and drive her around. It was one of the only ways she could fall asleep soundly, and I lived with my parents in a nice neighborhood. One night I'm driving, and my girl had finally fallen asleep. It was about 9 p.m. at this point. I was hungry and wanted to let her fall into a deeper sleep so I could move her. I got some food from a drive through and pull over onto a side street right next to the restaurant so I can eat. I'm finishing up eating and looking back to check on my kid when suddenly these super bright headlights pull up right behind me, a little too close. I wave apologetically. None of my windows are tinted, and I used to drive a Jeep Compass, so the back window was big enough for them to see me. I assumed whoever it was was trying to park at the house I'm currently in front of. I pull away and start down the street. Once I'm at the end of the block and around the corner, I see the headlights again. No biggie. This is a semi-busy street, so people cut down this way all the time. Only this person is riding my ass like I'm not moving fast enough. I get annoyed and change lanes to get out of their way. Almost as soon as I do, though, they follow right behind. At this point, I realize that the car was the same sedan that had pulled up behind me on the last street. Now they're too close for me to see the make of their car, and the high beams are on so I can't see anything behind me. I cursed myself for not paying better attention to the car before. I didn't want to be crazy paranoid, so I took some unnecessary side streets past my neighborhood. This person followed me behind, turn for turn and lane change for lane change. I panicked and called my dad. I know I should have called the police, but I was 21 and did the first thing I could think of. He was at work 30 minutes away. He had terrible reception and decided to call me back on the landline at his work. He was on his cell phone with the sheriff's department for our neighborhood, and they told me to drive down to the station. It had been close to 40 minutes since this person had started following me, and they kept riding closer and closer. I was running lights and swerving around at this point, just trying to catch someone's attention. I drive to the station. And no one is fucking there. Not one car. No cruisers. No one in the department office. Not even any cars in the small parking lot. They wanted me to pull into the lot and wait for an officer to arrive. Now I'm alone. My one-year-old is fussing in the back seat. And there's only one way out of the parking lot. I nope right the fuck past the station. And tell my dad to tell the officer on the phone to fuck off because no one was there. I see a sheriff's car at the light ahead and start to honk and flash my lights as he drives across the intersection. He either misses what I'm doing or he just decides to ignore it. It's now been over an hour and the person has tapped my ass four times. Eventually, I saw another sheriff's car and laid onto the horn. I think he caught on because he busted a U-turn and came back towards us. Right as soon as he did... The car behind me disappeared into the mall across the street, and the officer followed. I was instructed to go back to the station and wait, so I did. Eventually, I was waiting so long, I finally decided to go inside, triple locking the door of my car because I was so terrified. The office had no one except a non-emergency phone on the desk that only connected me to other extensions. To wrap the story up, they made me feel crazy and said they never even found the car. That all he could do was take a statement since nothing had even happened. I was he offered to follow years me old. and my daughter home. It was the to drive away as soon as I parked while I was, I was left to take my sleeping my kid inside, house. shaking so hard I couldn't even unlock the door. And we were trying to I figure ran out upstairs we to my to mom's room. She was on pain Something medication happened. after surgical there procedures exactly and was right. asleep. But we ended up I shook her awake, sobbing, and told her what happened. Bad, and I was and it took me two fight. days to sleep again at Put night, my shoes and, and to this day I refuse to go on night drives with my daughter. I changed my mind, but I refused. My best friend lived probably three miles away, and it wasn't too bad of a walk. 
Plus, it was the middle of the day, so I figured everything would be fine. I called my best friend and told her what had happened, and that I was coming over. And then I went on my merry way. As soon as I made it out of the parking lot of my boyfriend's apartment complex, I had this weird, awful, sinking feeling in my gut. I brushed it off and figured it was just me being overwhelmed from the arguing. From where my boyfriend lived to my best friend's house, it was pretty much a straight shot down a main road, but there were always lots of people out and a lot of traffic. I had walked it a hundred times before on my way to and from school, so I was comfortable and not really paying attention at all. I made it probably halfway to my friend's house, and just happened to look further up ahead on the same side of the street I was on. I saw a man in a small parking lot, standing beside a car. He seemed out of place to me. It was weird because I lived in a somewhat big city with all different types of people. He had dark sunglasses on, and was just surveying the road like he was searching for something. I remember thinking it was really strange. I made it to the next intersection and looked up ahead again, while waiting to cross the street. Again, there he was, the same side I was on, just standing around and looking towards the road. Something seemed really off, and I remember thinking that I didn't want to pass by him a second time, so I opted to cross the road in the other direction and not be on the same side of the street he was on. I crossed and was now walking on the left side of the road against the direction of traffic. Feeling a bit more cautious, I started to keep an eye on all of my surroundings. The man was gone now and I felt okay again. I was one street light away from where I needed to turn to get to my friend's house. She lived just a block off the main road. Suddenly, I hear footsteps behind me and I turn around. There was a man coming towards me. And it was him. He saw me look at him and started walking faster to catch up with me. He had a friendly smile on his face. He caught up with me fast and started to ask me directions to some place I've never heard of before. I told him that I didn't know and kept walking hoping he'd say okay and leave me alone. He didn't. He stayed right next to me and kept asking questions. I was starting to panic and trying to think of what I should do next, but I felt like I was in a haze. I couldn't think straight and I was getting more and more scared. I told him that he shouldn't be talking to me because my dad was on his way to pick me up and my dad wouldn't like it. It sounded stupid, but it was the only thing that came to mind. The man told me that I was a liar and that no one was coming for me. I kept insisting and telling him he needed to leave me alone. I should have just ran away at this point, but like I said, I literally couldn't think straight. All of a sudden he put his arm around me and draped it over my shoulders and said, Let's go. Now. I was in disbelief. Here's this stranger, this man who's putting his hands on me and trying to pull me with him. I felt like my heart was going to explode, but I was just walking with him. I couldn't do anything but just go along. He had turned me around, and we were now walking in the direction where traffic was going. Everything was in super slow motion. I remember looking down at the ground and watching my feet just walking, step after step, just walking with the stranger. He kept trying to talk to me, but it felt like I was underwater, and I couldn't really hear him or anything clearly. Finally, I looked ahead up the road and noticed where he was trying to take me. There was an abandoned house, almost completely surrounded by a tall brick wall. It felt like hours had passed, but it was only seconds. I felt almost like the blood was draining from my body. I started seeing flashes of myself, dead somewhere and thrown into a ditch. That was it. I finally snapped out of it. After being in this sort of trance, a thought finally came into my mind. My phone. I needed to get my phone. Luckily, my bag was on my right arm and he was on my left, so he didn't notice me slowly reaching in to grab it. It was a flip phone, so I was able to open up and find the call button, 
and tap it twice to redial the last person I had called, without ever having to take my hand out of the bag. I remembered that the last call I had made was to my best friend, when I was telling her I was coming over. Thank God. I knew she'd answer. I gave it a few seconds to ring, and then just started screaming as loud as I could. I brought the phone up to my face and screamed help, over and over. I felt a rush of tears stream down my face. He saw my phone and yanked it out of my hand, slamming it closed. I kept screaming anyway. He started yelling at me and cussing, and I remember him screaming at me to shut the fuck up. He put my phone away in his pocket and tightened his grip on me. He had one hand on each of my arms as he walked beside me. His fingers dug into them, and he pushed me, forcing me to walk with him. I remember shuffling around and trying to get away but there was a lot of gravel in the sidewalk and I couldn't find good footing. He was still yelling and cussing at me, and I could smell alcohol all over his breath. It made me feel sick. This whole time there were cars driving by us, and I couldn't understand why no one was stopping to help me. We were getting closer to the house, and I remember thinking, I have to get away now. I stopped walking as abruptly as I could and dropped. I literally just bent down and jumped backward, slipping right out of his hands. I think it caught him off guard. I saw a glimpse of him look at me from under his arm, and he looked furious. I turned around immediately and started to run as fast as I could. I was so afraid that he was running after me. I ran directly into the road at oncoming traffic, hoping that he wouldn't follow me. I was hysterically screaming and crying, and waving in my arms desperately at people to stop. Instead, they swerved out of the way. I remember seeing people's faces looking at me as they just drove past. No one was stopping, and no one would help me. I turned and looked behind me, but the man was nowhere in sight. I got back on the sidewalk and kept running in the direction I was going. I came to a side street. There was a silver van stopped in the middle of the road with a younger woman flagging me down and asking if I was okay. I ran up to her, telling her someone had tried to kidnap me. She handed me her phone to call the police, and told me that it was okay now and that she would wait with me. Another car pulled up behind hers, a white work truck filled with tools. Two men jumped out of the truck and ran over to see what was wrong. The woman explained what had happened while I was still on the phone with the police. They were older Hispanic men that didn't seem to speak English very well, but they understood what she had told them. One of the men ran back to the truck and brought me some of his big gulp to drink. It was a watered-down Pepsi, but it was so hot out, and my throat had hurt from screaming. I drank it and thought about how refreshing it was. The other man asked me what the kidnapper looked like. I described to them what the man had looked like and what he was wearing and without another beat, they jumped back into their truck to drive around and track him down. Finally, a police officer arrived, and I thanked the woman who had stayed with me. I walked over to the officer and explained what had happened while she drove off. After I told him everything, he told me I shouldn't have dressed so revealing and it probably wouldn't have happened. I was wearing a regular tank top and long leggings. It was 110 degrees out that day. He gave me his cell phone so I could call my mom to come pick me up. She answered and I told her what happened. She was 45 minutes away across town at work, and I think those 45 minutes were some of the worst of her life because she didn't know exactly what had happened or if I was okay. The police officer then offered to take me to my friend's house, which was only a minute or two away while we waited for my mom to get there. I ran up and knocked on her door crying and had a police officer with me, so when she opened the door, I couldn't understand why she looked so confused. I had called her and screamed for help, so surely she knew something was wrong, and I'd called and told someone I needed help. No. She answered the phone and heard me crying for help, and thought nothing of it and went about her day. Not sure why that didn't bother me more than it did back then. Finally, my mom got there, and I started crying again as soon as I saw her. I thought I'd never see her again. I hugged her and just cried even more. She talked to the officer who had dropped me off. He had only filed a police report, 
and wouldn't even attempt to look for the man who had just tried to kidnap me, because too much time had passed and he would be long gone by now. He had sent another officer to the scene of where everything had happened to try and find any evidence. He found my phone thrown beside the brick wall near the house. They then fingerprinted it, but all of the prints were too smudged to be of use. And that was that. The police went on their way and never gave it another thought. It's been ten years since then, but I still think about it a lot. I always make sure all my doors are locked, and I never really go anywhere alone. I have trouble just walking to the mailbox sometimes. I get scared getting out of my car to put gas in it if there are men around. I have to have my husband leave work to come home and be with me if there's ever any normal appointments at our home, like the maintenance man having to come inside to fix something, and I instantly panic if I lose sight of him at the store while we're out. I still cry about it sometimes. I can't even really remember anymore what the man's face looked like, but I'm still plagued by him to this day and I hope I never have to meet him again. And this story all starts back when I was about six or seven. I was always a quiet girl that liked spending a lot of time alone reading or playing. I had a lot of friends, but never spent much time with them outside of school because my alone time was something that was always very important to me. After moving to a new city closer to some relatives that I didn't see much growing up, my aunt decided that it would be a great idea if I spent my after-school hours playing with her son, who was about seven years older than me. My cousin was an odd kid. He never got on well with other people, and usually ended up being an outcast. He had no friends, and spent much of his time indoors watching TV or playing video games. He was prone to random fits of rage that usually ended with him breaking things or screaming a whole lot. He was also a lot bigger than most people his age, and was pretty huge compared to me. Around when we started hanging out, he was already about six foot four and pretty overweight. He also had what I've come to call dead eyes. But when he looks at you, it's like he's looking through you, and any emotion he showed never reached his eyes, other than anger. My aunt thought it would be beneficial for the both of us if we started spending our free time together so that he would have a friend and I wouldn't be spending so much time alone. My parents weren't as enthusiastic about it, but thought that it wouldn't cause any harm. Everybody in the family always felt bad for my cousin, due to him always being alone and having parents that weren't exactly fit to be so. It was more like I was babysitting him more than anything, which, looking back, was a horrible situation to put a young girl in, with the guy so much older and bigger. It started out innocent enough. We shared some common interests, such as reading and video games, and he seemed not to be as violent to me. Maybe because I was family. It's hard to say. It got to the point that we were talking or hanging out every day. People often mistook him for my older brother. When I got to be about nine or ten, though, things started to change. By that time, he was seventeen, had been kicked out of school, and was regularly intimidating people. He was socially awkward to the point that I was the only person who he could have a conversation with and he came to depend on my presence. I couldn't hang out with friends or ever have free time, or he would call up screaming and crying that I was betraying him or abandoning him. Then the threats started. I remember being in his apartment with him one day while his parents were out, and he was showing me a new knife that he had bought. For whatever reason, I was never afraid of him, even when he would have outbursts around me. It always seemed that I could calm him down, and I couldn't imagine that he would hurt me, as I was his only friend. It was this day that he laid down that we were going to run away from home when I turned 16, and that I was going to be his wife, take care of him like a mother, basically, while he would spend his days playing video games. I sort of laughed it off, thinking it was a bizarre joke, 
or some sort of game he was playing. This made him really angry. He flew off the handle, started screaming and waving the knife around with the blade out, that we were meant for each other, and there was no way he would let me live if he couldn't have me. Being a naive idiot, I didn't tell my parents or his, and things started to get worse from there. If I tried to put off hanging out with him, he would threaten to kill my parents, or my cats, or his parents. He would come to my apartment late at night, knock on the door, then run off. I guess just to let me know he could. At the same time, he began doubling down on me being destined to be his lover. He would use his allowance to buy inappropriate clothing for me, or flowers. He would write poems and fanfics about our life together. He would call me in the middle of the night and try to get me to talk about inappropriate things with him. He also became very controlling. It got to the point that just going to school for the day would set him off, because it was less time he got to spend with me. I remember being about 14, and him killing his pet parrot in a fit of rage because I was late coming over to his apartment after school. It's cliche as hell, but he was screaming, Look what you made me do! over and over, and then crying and hugging his parrot. It was one of the most terrifying things I've ever seen. He had a new parrot the next day. I can't remember how, but I ended up telling my parents about everything he was doing, and that I was afraid to ever be around him. They banned him from seeing me anymore, and told his aunt that he was scaring me and not to bring him to family get-togethers. I was honestly relieved and thought it would be over that I could start living some sort of a life of my own without being tied to the hip to him. But then, the threatening phone calls, text messages, and social media messages started. He would either try to catfish me by pretending to be someone else, or he would straight up tell me that I was going to die soon, or my family was, that it was my fault for ruining his life. He sounded deranged, the way he would scream and scream, as all caps messages. I had to stop going out for walks because he started showing up and watching me. I honestly thought he was going to kill me. Every day was constant fear until I was 16 or so and got my first boyfriend. When he heard that I was with someone, I got my last message from him, saying I betrayed him in the worst way possible and that one day, it could be weeks from now or even years, he would kill me. Everything sort of died down after that. He never came to family gatherings again. He became a neat and lives off his parents playing video games all day. He found someone else online that he started to stalk, which I guess took his focus off of me. My life went back to some sort of normal until I was about 21. Then I received a phone call from him asking me to help get his life back together. Because according to him, the day I left his life was the day he lost all hope. I hung up on him immediately. It's been years now. He's in his mid-thirties and is still a neat. I still fear he'll come for me one day. I see him every once in a while, walking around where I now live. He looks terrifying. There's honestly so much more to the story that I've forgotten over the years. It's become such a blur due to a lot of other things that I was coping with around the same time. But I can say he made my life a nightmare for many years. Some of the more painful aspects of the story I can't even get into without throwing myself into a fit of anxiety. I hope to God that I never have to be in the same room as him again. Because if that happens, I don't think I'll come out the other side alive. I saw another post about a school bus, and it reminded me of this incident when I was very young. My bus route was long, anywhere between one to two hours, and I was one of the last stops. It was on a really rural route, with lots of mountains, dirt roads, and hollowways. Being a rural area, most of these hollows were long, windy roads that families and relatives lived on. Normally just one or two families of kids being dropped off at the same points. 
This meant that if a particular family of kids didn't ride the bus that day, for whatever reason, that the bus driver could skip that hollow and save us anywhere from 5 to 30 minutes off the total route. How could this ever be a bad thing, right? But one particular hollow, about 5 miles long, had only two stops for two different families. The second family lived at the furthest point down the road. It was easily three to four miles past the first family's drop-off point, down a crooked, dead-end, single-lane dirt road. It was the worst part of the route each time. Now on days the second family didn't ride the bus, if the driver skipped driving all the way to the second family's house, then it would save a 20-minute round trip, not to mention the stress of driving on the claustrophobic dirt road in a huge hulking school bus. There were also times the family waited to pick up the kids in their own car at the first drop-off to save the bus a bit of time and spare it the experience of driving down that road. So, of course, whenever they could, the driver would turn around at the first family's drop-off point. However, this was not as smooth a turn as going the full way to the second family's house. This drop-off point was a small circular area, with a couple of different driveways spiraling off of it, only one of which was large enough for a school bus to fit, and definitely not big enough for a bus to do a 360 turn in one swoop. With the help of the larger driveway, though, a three-point turn could get us out of there easy-peasy. At most, the bus needed two meters of this driveway space and hardly 30 seconds of its time. We do this happily for as long as I can remember, until either new residents moved in, or the existing residents of the trailer in this driveway about 20 meters away lost their minds. Suddenly, there's a large red farm gate at the extreme end of the driveway. No possible way for the bus to turn around when closed. For the first few months, whenever we could cut this route short by turning there, the driver would stop the bus during the three-point turn, open the gate, barely reverse into the driveway, pull out, stop the bus again, close it, and carry on, saving us all 20 minutes of needless driving. Keep in mind this only happened when the second family either did not ride the bus or was being picked up, so not very often at all. Then one day we turn up and there's now a lock on the gate. Huh. So we drive the 20 minutes and just carry on. Still, each time we have a chance to do the turn, the driver would check if it was unlocked. I don't know if it was ever requested to leave it unlocked, but I know from the driver's reactions they wanted it to be. So if it did happen to be, we would take the shortcut and the driver would put the gate back as it was. To my knowledge, no one ever complained about this. Then comes the day of the trap. We get to the first drop-off, and the second family was not riding the bus. Nothing looks amiss, except, hey, what do you know? The gate is open. I can remember the smile on the driver's face as she puts the bus in reverse and begins to turn. At this point in the ride, it's just myself and three to four other kids, only one being a grade above me, and I was barely six years old. Of course, I was chattering away with my friend and didn't notice that we had stopped. Once I did start to look around, however, to my confusion, there were an assortment of ATVs, four-wheelers, side-by-sides, and the like, and actual cars that had pulled out of the side driveways to surround the bus in every single direction. To make it more confusing and thinking back horrific, they all had an assortment of firearms. Yes, real guns. Now I'm six, and I grew up around guns. I wasn't scared by what I saw, but I also didn't realize we were being held hostage. All I remember is the feeling of profound confusion, not being able to work out why we were sitting there, what these people were doing, and why the other kids were crying. Maybe I was blissfully ignorant, but the driver told us to play on the floor and not look out the windows. Me being me, I propped my jacket up over the window in my seat and told everyone we could play under my row. I ended up having a great, albeit slightly boring, time waiting. It went on for what felt like hours, and I never looked out the windows during it, but I'm sure it was really only an hour at most, give or take. Our parents slowly started showing up looking for us. 
I remember two kids being allowed out before me. Then, as I was growing truly bored, my grandfather showed up to save me, too. He came onto the bus, spoke to the driver, and held my hand as he walked me back to his truck, no one else saying a word except my cheery goodbye to the driver. I remember all of the gang just staring her down as I walked away, and she never moved from her seat the entire ordeal. I didn't know what happened after I left. It was only later that I grew up to realize the severity of the event. I know for sure my grandfather and parents called the school system, but I never heard of any punishment or follow-up. The gate was never left open again, and we still had to drive that route each day, always driving it all the way through. Except, of course, for those blissful days both family of kids didn't ride and we could skip it altogether. The same bus driver stayed on the route. She was honestly an angel to remain so calm and collected throughout. My husband and I were at the supermarket, and our baby was being especially fussy, so we took her for a quick drive, the motion of which usually calms her down. It only took about ten minutes to settle her, and I was still in the store, but unsure how much longer I'd be in, and there's poor cell reception inside. So he pulled back into the parking lot to wait for me. It was an unseasonably nice day, so he took her in her car seat to sit on one of the benches outside of the store. He took a business call and had just sat them down, absent-mindedly rocking the carrier. But when a woman, well-dressed, mid-thirties in average height, approached them. It's not uncommon for people to ask to play with our baby. She's got big rosy cheeks, soft wisps of gold hair, and the most adorable gurgly toothless grin, especially when she's deep into a good nap. But her nap schedule is paramount, so my husband was preparing to tell the woman that she couldn't actually play with our baby right then. She walked over right in their direction, brimming with nonchalant confidence, and before he could even finish his sentence explaining that she was napping and not to be touched, she picked up the carrier and started walking off. He was in shock for a minute, not fully believing someone would be ballsy enough to do something so sinister in plain daylight, so he said, Excuse me, put her down, as his panic mounted. She remained calm this entire time, but when he called after her, she started walking away more briskly than what she'd approached. He ran full speed ahead, trying to grapple the carrier out of her hands, finally resulting to restraining her arms. The woman starts yelling. Help! He's trying to take my baby! Kidnapping! Call 911! Kicking him in the shin and pulling a pink bottle of pepper spray out of her handbag. Of course, no one in the parking lot was clocking the earlier reaction, and assumed immediately that he really was a kidnapper. A lone man in a Deadpool t-shirt versus a tiny, well-dressed woman. Immediately, a man knocked my husband to the ground and was holding him down. He could hear bystanders encouraging the woman to file a police report, but she was doing a very convincing job of acting shaken up, and insisted she just wanted to get home. To make matters worse for my husband, she was driving a minivan. He was in a raw state of panic, realizing the entire parking lot had banded together to inadvertently facilitate the kidnapping of our daughter. He was begging and pleading with them, but nobody would listen. They just kept screaming at him that the jig was up, and he needed to lie still and wait for police and stop terrorizing a young mother. My husband finally had the novel idea to show them our family photos on his phone. But too panicked to think clearly. This manifested as him shouting, I have pictures of the baby on my phone. Of course, everyone interpreted this as him having either stalking photos or worse, pornographic images of the baby, I guess. It was at this point that a man, I can't entirely blame the man considering what he thought was going on, kicked my husband as hard as he could in the ribs. At this point I was coming out of the store and thought that he was being robbed by these people. I was yelling for security, so panicked my chest constricted and I could barely get any sound out. 
It was only then that I realized he did not have our baby with him. When I saw she was being held by a woman, I was relieved. I thought maybe the woman had intervened to move my daughter out of harm's way while my husband was being robbed and was walking away to get help. I couldn't find a security guard outside the store, so I ran up to the people holding my husband down, waving my wallet and pleading, take everything you want, just let up and leave us alone. One of the men holding him down said something like, Lady, we need to wait for the police to deal with him. I was so confused. Why would the muggers have to call the police? I just kept stammering, What do you mean? What are you talking about? And made out someone saying, He tried to abduct that woman's kid. I didn't understand. I was sure I'd misheard him. My husband would never hurt a child. And we have four kids. If you were going to commit a crime, bringing home another kid would be at the bottom of his list. I kept trying to understand what they were all saying, and suddenly, it all clicked. I looked around for the woman who had the baby carrier, and she was already halfway across the parking lot. I went into total ballistic tiger cub mode, literally leapt out of my heels and sprinted across the parking lot. I'm not a UFC fighter or anything, I've never even taken a self-defense class, so all I could think to do was grab the woman by her hair and squeeze her throat with my other hand. It didn't do much. She was starting to get away even as I grappled with her. Amazingly, none of the other bystanders had yet to connect that my husband was telling the truth, and this woman was absconding with my baby. I yanked on her hair as hard as I could, and that was enough to make her drop the carrier. I was so scared and surprised that I actually threw myself on top of the carrier, covering the entire thing like a blanket, and stayed that way without saying or doing anything else. The woman left. Not even one person tried to stop her, even though she was clearly leaving without the child she claimed was hers, which would be pretty damn incriminating if I'd watched the scene. Within the next couple of minutes, police had arrived. After that, there were still bystanders who exclaimed that my husband was trying to kidnap the baby. The police, to my horror, assumed that she must not have had bad intentions, the first questions they asked me after getting her description weren't investigated. They were questions thinly veiled trying to convince me not to pursue charges, still placing blame on my husband. A small sampling. Do your husband and the baby look dissimilar? Is there a chance she thought he was abducting the baby and was trying to intervene? Could your husband have been doing something inappropriate or violent to the baby that would make her feel compelled to extricate it from the situation? Did she seem groggy or confused? They spent more time verifying that the baby was actually mine than they concerned themselves with the fact that the baby was not actually hers. My husband had called his brother at that point, who works in an office with a lot of lawyers and connected with one ASAP, who gave us the priceless advice to get every officer's name and badge number, to request copies of the store security tapes right away and to escalate our complaint higher up the chain if these officers weren't taking us seriously. Finally, we had reason enough to believe that we were being taken seriously, and went home. We both just shook and cried, until we had to get our other kids from school. My husband is seething with rage and grappling with a feeling of helplessness from how little he was able to do, and two cracked ribs from when the man kicked him. To the officer's credit, they did ask if he'd like to press charges, but considering the man was genuinely convinced he was stopping a kidnapping at that time, and stayed to talk to police and apologize profusely when the truth became clear, he declined to press charges. Amazingly and frustratingly, there were still people who stuck around to talk to the police, who were giving my husband dirty looks, and one man even implored the police to involve CPS to verify it was really our baby. This past Monday, my co-workers and I returned to our hotel room from a day of work out in the field. Rebecca and I walked to our rooms, and as we stood outside of them, I opened mine and saw someone in the bathroom. Hello? I said, but nobody answered. My first instinct was that it was a cleaning lady in there for some reason, and then I saw my bag with my clothes in her hands. 
I whispered to my co-worker. There's a woman in my room. I had turned to the woman and asked, What are you doing with my stuff? It gets a little fuzzy here because I can't remember everything I said and what she said. But she kept mumbling about how her key still worked. How it still worked and that's how she got in. I was in shock. And she was obviously very flustered at having been caught mid-robbery. She dropped my bags and fumbled around with her purse and a white plastic bag. By this time, my coworker was behind me watching all the insanity unfold. The woman was scrambling and walking towards the door, and I asked, What's in the bag? Thinking it was probably my stuff. It's just my things. It's just my things. I'll show you. And so she did. I looked and I didn't see anything of mine. And so, since I was obviously in shock at this time, I didn't try to stop her. I went into my room and found it had been ransacked. I took a quick look around to see if anything had been taken. All of my electronics were still there. Then I went into the bathroom and saw my underwear, my bikini and my clothes shoved into my own bags randomly. Even my passport was shoved in there. I looked on the counter and saw that she had gotten into my medication. I'm not sure what was going through my head at the moment, other than that I wanted it back, so I ran out the door to go find her. I ran to the laundry room downstairs and out to the sides of the hotel. I didn't see her. I realized I was never going to find her, so my co-worker and I went down to the lobby to tell them what had happened. And then we called the police. We went back up to my room to wait, and I noticed there was a large metal bat on my bed, a little larger than one of those novelty wooden bats you can get at a baseball game, but there's also a flashlight on the end. She must have left it behind in her hurry. She also left behind a necklace that must have fallen out of her bag when she was scrambling with mine. I was mostly freaking out at this point, because I thought that she'd gotten away with my medication that I need. The police got there and took our statements, and looked around the room as well. One thing I noticed was that there were bits of drywall in the sink, and I pointed that out to the cops, but none of us really knew where it came from. We started looking at the door on the windows, to see if she had pried her way in somehow, but there was nothing. So we just kind of went with the idea that she had a spare key or something. Even though the hotel front desk was admin, there was no way that could be. The officer that came brought two more officers as backup, because they thought the woman might still be in the vicinity. But after our statements were taken, there was nothing else they could really do, so they left. I sat down to finally make some calls to tell people. And as I'm on the phone, I'm thinking about the drywall and the sink. It still didn't make sense to me. I'm on the phone and looking at the drywall and the mirror on the wall right above it. And then it hit me. I got my co-worker and asked her to help me pull out the mirror along the wall. When we took the mirror down, there was a hole just big enough for a desperate junkie to squeeze through. I asked Brian and Rebecca if I should call the cops again to let them know what I found, and my boss said, there's still two of them in the parking lot. I went down to tell them, the female cop kind of rolled her eyes, but the young guy said, I'll come check it out. They both came back up, looked in the hole, and found a pillow, blankets, cigarettes, clothes, toothbrushes. And this woman had been living in the wall behind my mirror for God knows how long. She had access to me in my room at all times. I know it might be hard to picture. There was a crawl space about two feet wide in between the two rows of rooms. One of the officers called the original officer to come back and take pictures of this. She explained to him what was going on, and all I could hear over the radio was, No fucking way. He comes back and takes pictures, and is just as mind-blown as the rest of us. Obviously, we packed up and left immediately. What's even crazier that she'd probably been there a long time. The last time we stayed at this hotel, I would randomly smell cigarette smoke and assumed someone was smoking in their bathroom and was traveling through the vents. But no, a junkie was smoking on the other side of my mirror. She had access to other rooms too, 
The holes in the walls were from a renovation, and the hotel hadn't properly patched and just covered up with mirrors. She could have been hanging out in people's rooms when they were gone, for all I know. Anyway, this was insane, and I'm taking a little time off. Hi, all. Happy New Year. Now, I just want to start off by saying that everybody in this story is safe, but it was one of the closest calls I've ever had in my life, and I feel like I have to tell my story in order to raise awareness. I live in a major city in practically the pit of hell state. Born and raised here, I'm very familiar with my surroundings. I'm also aware to the fact that my city is one of the worst hubs for human trafficking, and living here can be very, very dangerous. Despite all this, I've taken pride in knowing that I do everything I can to remain as safe as possible. I've had close calls before, and consider myself an avid murderino. I'm pretty prepped. At the time, I had two stings of pepper spray. One in my jacket pocket and one velcroed to my desk at work. I also had two trusty pocket knives. One always on me and the other in my car door pocket. Oh, my taser never leaves my bag either. I avoid shady situations and despite being a small lady, I know my stuff thanks to self-defense classes. My point is I'm a very paranoid small chihuahua and I still got into a scary situation. Anyway, on to the story. It's summer at this point, and hot as hell out. I've got a date with my favorite gal pal, and I swing by her place to pick her up. She tells me she has a job interview to go to first, and I agree to go with her. No big deal. She's a sweet tiny thing from a small town in the Midwest, and very new to the city life, and the wild things that can happen here. As we drive into a different city, I ask her about the job. It's a modeling gig. Oh, cool, for who? I found an ad on Craigslist. It's just some sports clothes. The Craigslist thing sets a small, distant alarm off in my head, but I try to push it to the side. Where the heck are we going, anyway? When we pull up to a Starbucks a bit outside of the city, the alarm in my head becomes a little less faint. Relax, I tell myself. I've gone to legit job interviews at coffee shops before, and there's always been a good reason. We arrive first, late still, but end up waiting about 15 minutes. Kind of weird, but Cat's relieved we're not the rude ones when she gets a text saying he's here. I look around the Starbucks and outside at the parking lot trying to figure out who this mystery man can be, when I notice a tall, well-dressed man step out of a black SUV. He smiles at us as he approaches, and I figure that's our guy. I could have sworn, though, that that SUV had been parked there for quite a while. I ask Kat if she wants me to step in line and grab her a drink, but she practically begs me to stay with her. Okay, I can do that, but... I don't think it looked very professional. I don't protest, though. The man named Jack leads us to an isolated table outside and doesn't say much about my presence other than it was okay for me to be there. I get on my phone and shoot a text to my fiancé, explaining where I was and what I was doing. He shoots back a, be careful, and I sit pretty to watch the show. Jack had this strange accent I couldn't place my finger on. Looking back, I'm not even sure it was real. He starts asking Kate the usual questions, and I notice she's absolutely bombing the interview. She doesn't have much experience, and didn't bother to bring a portfolio, but despite this, he doesn't seem to care. The alarm in my head is much louder than a whisper, but it completely blares when he asks if she's comfortable doing lingerie shoots as well. Dear sweet cat says she doesn't have an issue with it, but would prefer to mostly do sports-like clothing, like they had discussed earlier. She has to see some of his work, and he pulls up a lingerie Instagram. He holds it in front of her face and pulls it away immediately, 
and when she asked if there was more she'd be doing, he says, that was it, and hurries the conversation along. He says we need to go right now to his studio at a place he briefly mentioned the name of, to sign papers and get everything squared away. It has to be done today. He's not working tomorrow and his co-workers won't do it right. I absolutely hate everything about this, and I'm trying to glare some sense into her, but nothing is getting through. Cat agrees, and he turns his attention to me. Do you want to be a part of this, too? I immediately know now that nothing about this is professional. I look down at my beat-up docks and green cargo pants, a shirt that has flames and a slightly edgy logo on it, and can't help but scoff. That's not really my thing. I'm just the ride. He studies me for a second and then says we can all ride with him, directing his attention to Cat. No, I don't want to leave my car. We'll follow behind you. He looks offended that I butt in, but asks where we parked. Right in front of the store. I got it. I pull Kate to the jeep and we make sure to walk behind him. As soon as we get into the car, I lock the doors and try to keep from freaking out. We're not going. This doesn't feel right. What about the lingerie? Everything I say, she has an excuse for. We pull out of the parking lot and I follow Jack's SUV. But the whole time I'm trying to figure out how to get out of this. Kat doesn't like the lingerie thing, but this could be a door for her. And she desperately needs the money. But what if it is legit? He was alone anyways. You have your knife and spray, right? Of course I do. But I'm five foot two, and this man's six foot three, and Jack could very well have friends. I don't want to possibly have to kill or be killed. I realize Cat is bad shit. We drive along as I try to talk to her, and we start driving out into the desert, in the middle of absolutely nowhere. There's a divider in the road that prevents U-turns, and I get an eerie feeling Jack knew to take us this way. I'm desperate at this point. I pull out my phone and snap a picture of Jack's SUV license plate. I upload it to Snapchat and Facebook, where friends can see it. Kat starts getting uncomfortable when she realizes just how far we've driven. The name of the place he mentioned springs back into my head, and I know it's familiar from somewhere. A commercial jingle of some sort that's distant but catchy. It's a restaurant or a hotel or something. You wouldn't have a studio there. Please just look it up. She does. It's a casino. Unless this man has rented out a space, he wouldn't have a studio there. It's not consistent with the information he gave us at all. Kat is freaked out at this point. I tell her that this isn't uncommon, and he was trying to confuse us the entire time. Throughout the entire interview, she had a confused and hesitant look on her face, like this wasn't what she was promised or expecting at all. Cat finally agrees that we need to get out of there, and I start to breathe easy again. I notice that every five or so minutes, there's a break in the medians. It's a rough, quick stop and turnaround, but it'll have to do. I do, and we absolutely gun it. Kate gets a call from Jack, and at first she ignores it. I convince her to call back, and she gets nothing at all, like the number had blocked her. It didn't go through. I tell her to screenshot the Craigslist ad, but she can't find it anywhere. It's like every trace of Jack disappeared. We go back to her apartment and I tell her she needs to report it now. She promises she will, but later she doesn't because she doesn't want her husband to know. He didn't even know she had this interview to begin with, and she didn't want him to know what happened. If I hadn't driven her, she would have gone alone without telling a soul and who knows what would have happened. Now, I tried not to scold her too badly, but I just reminded her that our city was very different and much more dangerous than where she's from. Sweet cat, I hope you're a little more awakened to the world. And I'm sorry for that. It's been a few months since we parted ways, and I'm still worried to death over all the oblivious crazy things you get into. Since the incident, I have three pepper sprays, one new one for the car, and a new pocket knife to carry around. I'm almost four months pregnant, and now finally ready to get out of this damn dangerous city. Please, please be safe out there.
It's such a scary world. And be damn careful with Craigslist. Before the story, uh, just some quick notes. Keep in mind, the story happened over the span of only a month and a half, and everything happened quite quickly. For context, my name will be Cat, his name will be John, and his mom's name is Karen. This is a story I've only ever told a handful of people, and I'll try to be as clear and accurate as I can, as this happened just over a year ago, but obviously I can't remember everything verbatim. I know I've made mistakes, and I'll probably mention it a few times, but honestly, I've criticized my own decisions a million times over, and it's not useful to think about what could have been done. About a year ago, I had just gone through a bad breakup. He dumped me over text on Valentine's Day, and after having been together for quite a while, this was a big shock. I was absolutely devastated, and felt pretty bad about myself. I only took about two weeks before I was looking for another boyfriend, more or less a rebound guy, and that's when I met John. We met on Tinder and instantly hit it off. I was in my first year of university, studying biology, and he was in his first year of a different university studying history. He was smart and friendly, and had a lot of common interests with me. He was giving me some weird vibes but maybe it was that he just seemed a bit desperate. Honestly, I was too after my bad breakup, so I decided to push it out of my mind. After only a few days of talking, he asked me to go on a date with him to a play. I was so excited because that was such an interesting date idea, and I thought it was pretty romantic. We go on the date, and it goes pretty well. He rides the subway back a few stops with me, and I tell him about my ex. He tells me that he can't believe anyone would let a pretty girl like me go, and that he would do anything to make sure he got to keep me if he were dating me. Having read the title, you can see how creepy that statement is now. But I was maybe naive, or just a bit happy that someone agreed that my ex was an asshole. I took it as a compliment and saw nothing wrong with it. We kept messaging and going on occasional dates after this and all was well. After a few dates, John had told me that he had really bad depression and anxiety. It's important for me to mention that I also have pretty extreme depression and mental health problems, and my bad breakup kind of launched me into a downward spiral. It was almost a relief to hear him say that, because I felt like he wouldn't judge me for having depression too. After that, we could confide in each other about it, and help each other get out of our bad mental states. After this revelation, we got really close, really fast. We had only dated for a month, but we had already had an intense relationship, and I even thought that I loved him. Another problem with him was his mother, Karen. She was extremely possessive of him, and maybe it's because of his depression, but he couldn't do anything without telling his mother first. One night, he fell asleep at my place and forgot to set an alarm, and when he woke up, he had 10 missed calls and around 50 text messages from his mom trying to find him. She had apparently called every hospital in the area looking for him. She knew he was going to spend the night. She was just concerned because he slept two hours later than he said he would. She would do other things to manipulate him, like verbally abuse him or tell him he's a bad son if he doesn't do everything she wants. She set limits on how often and when he could come to my place. I wasn't happy with this, obviously. I told him I thought it was ridiculous how she treated him like a child, and that he was an adult and could go on dates whenever he wanted. If she wants to know where he is, that's fine, but he shouldn't have to ask permission. We had an argument about it, but he was obviously a mama's boy, so I dropped it. I still hadn't met his mom at this point, so who was I to judge? Another thing I'll mention is that one time he had asked me to do a role play with him, in which I wear his glasses and call him specifically Sweetie. He was very clear that he wanted me to call him that. He told me it was a teacher fetish, and I told him I wasn't into that kind of thing. He asked me a few times and never really dropped it, but I always said no. It comes back later. 
After one particularly bad night, he came over to console me and I told him I was feeling really depressed. His response was to ask me to marry him. This was after only just one month of dating. I laughed, thinking he was joking, but he didn't laugh. I laughed, thinking he was joking, but he didn't laugh. He just stared at me straight in my eyes. There was an awkward silence and I stuttered out. What? He looked at me and said, I'm serious. I love you and I want to spend my life with you. I laughed and gave him a firm no. He looked disappointed but he dropped it. I was a bit concerned about this and confided in my friend. She said if it were her she'd dump him. I thought it was quite strange, but really relied on the emotional support he gave me and was very emotionally fragile at the time, so I decided to pretend it didn't happen. I'd like to mention I know I made mistakes and ignored red flags, but when I was with him, he often implied or even stated that I was too mentally unwell or unattractive to ever get anyone better than him, and said other manipulative things that made me feel like breaking up with him would only be bad for me. He often made comments about how he would kill himself if I ever broke up with him, and it would be all my fault. Yeah, what a great guy. But I thought I loved him at the time. A few days later, I went over to his place for the first time. He lived with his parents, so when his mom got home from work, I of course introduced myself. She seemed very skeptical of me and refused to shake my hand. She gave a big fake smile and said, Hi. She started focusing all her attention on John. Hi, sweetie, she said, giving him a big kiss right on the lips. Yeah. She also wore very similar glasses to him and called him sweetie all night. That was basically the only thing she called him. Sound familiar to anything else I mentioned? I was very much creeped out, but I decided to keep my mouth shut for now. His mom never spoke to me, only ever talking to me if it was necessary, and I got a very weird vibe off of her. I had only gone to her house and met her willingly one time more after this, and it basically went the exact same except this time I was doing homework, and she kept making comments about how I was stupid because I couldn't do my homework on my own. I tried to argue back with her and got called a bitch, but John shut us both down and we all moved on. His dad also lived there, but mostly said nothing, and lurked around in the background not saying much, or just staying in the basement. Fast forward a few days. I was still talking to John, but I think he sensed I was growing distant from him. We had been together about a month and a half at this point. I got a text from him very late night, telling me he was suicidal and needed me. I had a midterm the next day and told him I was sorry that I couldn't be there as I needed to sleep and be at school in the morning for my midterm. He was very upset, however, so I suggested he go to the hospital and told him I could meet him there after I was done. He didn't respond, and after a half hour I get a text from him. He tells me he's outside my residence building, and his mom drove him. I told him again that I couldn't go to his place. He says it's okay and that he just wanted to talk. I gave in and went outside to meet him and go for a walk. He just starts walking me in the direction of the parking lot. I got a very bad feeling in my stomach. I don't know why, but I suddenly felt very scared. I said to him, why, why don't we walk this way? And try to turn and go in the other direction. No, it's fine. He grabbed my arm very tightly. I don't know what else to do, so I say, John, you're making me really uncomfortable. Why are you taking me to the parking lot? He said nothing and kept walking in silence. I tried to pull my arm away, but he tightened his grip. I called his name loudly, but he just kept telling me that it was okay. Let me go home, John, I say, firmly pulling on my arm. No one else was around to help me, and I was very scared. I don't think you want to do that, he said, emotionless. I was about to cry at this point, and I was so confused and scared. He starts explaining. 
Listen, cat. My mom is in the driveway. And if you don't get in the car soon, she's going to call the police and tell them you're suicidal. The police will come here and cause a scene, and then hold you against your will. My brain started going a million miles a minute. I lived in university residence, and really, really didn't want the police to pick me up where everyone could see me and cause a scene. I had also been to the hospital before, and my school had warned me of possible repercussions if I tried to harm myself on campus again which he reminded me of. I was really confused and felt betrayed. However, quickly weighing the pros and cons in my head, I thought supporting my boyfriend when he needs me and not causing a scene would be the easiest thing to do, still not realizing what he was trying to do. I tell him I'm not happy and that he's blackmailing me, and that I don't want to be with him if he's going to treat me this way. But the threats continue, so I go to his car. I get there, and there's his evil mother, Karen, with the most disgusting, ugly smirk on her face. I was just about to call the police, she says. John stands behind me as I get in the back of the car, and he gets in the front. She starts to drive. As the shock wore off, I realized that I was fucking pissed off. I started yelling that they were manipulating me, and go off on Karen for manipulating her son and being a bad mother and him for being a bad boyfriend. Meanwhile, Karen is screaming at me that I'm a slut and a bad girlfriend, and that I should kill myself because I'm such a bad influence for John. We had one of the most intense arguments I've ever had. I hate confrontation, and I honestly didn't know I was capable of so much rage, but adrenaline and fear does crazy things to people. Karen then pulls over the car. Get out, she says. I lunge at the door, ready to run away. But I'll call the police on you, I hesitate. Who will they believe? A reliable older lady with a respectable job? Or a slutty little autistic hood rat like you? Especially with your history of mental health. And then she laughs. And the situation dawned on me. I couldn't leave. While I hesitated to think, my hand still on the door handle... She escalated her threats from telling the police I was suicidal to telling the police in my school that I had assaulted her and her son after he tried to break up with me. Even though the car was parked and the door was unlocked, I couldn't leave. In my car, you don't get to talk to me like that, so either be civil and quiet or get the fuck out. John stayed quiet throughout this whole car ride, not defending himself or his mother, nor helping me. Just stone cold and expressionless. I started sobbing and crying and begging her to please let me go, to which she said, you have every right to leave. I felt like I had no options, so I swallowed my pride, apologized to the disgusting Karen, and let myself get driven to their house. I tried texting my friend what was going on, but she wouldn't answer. Once we got there, it was like one or two in the morning, and I wasn't sure because, of course, my phone had died. Great timing. Karen had been taunting me. Karen had been taunting me and making fun of me the whole ride home, and I wasn't even able to defend myself after her new threats. I was still crying, and John pulled me out of the car. He held on to me as I went inside. I don't know if it was because he wanted to get me in quickly, or because I could barely move because I was crying so hard, but they kept shushing me and Karen raised her hand as if to slap me if I didn't shut up. I stifled my tears. Once we got inside, John brings me straight into his room. He asks as if it's normal, if I wanted to watch a movie, but I just lay down on his bed and sobbed. He sits beside me and touches my arm in what could have been a comforting way under different circumstances. I pull away as he just quietly watches videos, and occasionally tells me how this was for the best. Now I couldn't hurt myself as long as he was protecting me, and we could be safe together. His dad was home, but the whole time everything was happening, he said nothing to me, and only came into John's room one time to give me a strange look and then leave immediately. John's mom came in a while later, and told me to sit up and stop crying, saying it was the best for me and John. She was only doing this because she cared about us. I don't have anything to say to her, so I just pet their dog, and didn't make eye contact. She berates and insults and makes fun of me, 
with no reaction other than a few snide comments from me that John would tell me were uncalled for, and more tears and silence. I can take an insult, but she crossed the line when she started talking about how my mother was abusive, and how I deserved it, and she could see why I got abused. My mother may have been abusive, but that crossed the line. She had no right to talk about that, and John had no right to share my privacy with her. She then went on to say that she was a much better mother, and I should be grateful she was giving me this privilege. The whole time I was there, she kept implying that this was in some sick way supposed to help me. I feel like I was only there for John to have someone with him, though. I lost it at the comments about my mom and started yelling at her about how she's abusive, and worse than my mother, and that I hated her. We have a screaming match for a while. After more insults and yelling, she storms off. It's just me and John, and I tell him I'm breaking up with him and want to leave now. He goes to get his mom, who says I'm having a rough night and don't mean it, and we should both just sleep. John gives me pajamas to wear, and I get dressed in his closet and go to bed. He was sleeping beside me. I was uncomfortable sleeping beside him because I felt betrayed and scared, even violated. I wanted to leave more than anything. I felt like an animal in a cage. I got up and bolted to the front door, only for him to run behind me and grab me and have Karen block my way. I started screaming. Let me go, please. I'm sorry. I was sobbing and trying to be as clear as I could through my tears. Karen looked at me like I was the most disgusting thing she'd ever seen. Grow up, she said and walked off. John brought me back to his room and locked the door. His mom came back and he let her in a few minutes later. She had some kind of pill to help me sleep. I refused to take it. She kept insisting, but I kept resisting. I'm not trying to poison you, she kept shouting, but I didn't trust her. John took one first to prove they were safe, and it was clear after over an hour of arguing and John taking one that I wasn't going to have a choice. I pretended to take one at first, but the stupid bitch checked my mouth and made sure I actually swallowed it. Basically shoved it down my throat after she realized I didn't take the other one. And after a while, I felt very tired and fell asleep. I still don't know what she gave me, but they tasted awful. It was the kind to dissolve under my tongue. I woke up the next morning and John and his mom were both in the kitchen eating breakfast. I saw my chance. I was alone. I got dressed hella fast and pulled my phone where he had hidden it, still not charged. It had my fare card for public transport in the case, though, so I pocketed my phone and quickly snuck to the door. Nothing had ever been so intense for me before. I put on my shoes really quick and opened the door and ran as fast as I could. I ran like the fucking wind, on the verge of tears and shaking. I had never run so fast. I didn't know the neighborhood, and I didn't know how to get home, but I just needed to get away. I have no idea if they chased me or not, or even if they noticed right away. The dog stayed quiet. I found a bus stop and got on the first bus to show up. I pulled out my card tab, and it didn't have any money on it. My brain just buzzed. I had no way to get home. I needed to be on this bus. The bus driver shrugged and just said, You should have had money. Meanwhile, I was staring at my card. I started sobbing, and I practically fell over as I was crying so hard, trying to explain what was happening. I made no sense, and the bus driver said, Whoa, are you okay? I said no and started crying harder. He just quietly handed me a transfer, and I thanked him and sat down quickly, noticing everyone staring at me. I didn't know how to get home, but I realized the bus was going to a subway station, and even though it was a long ride, I could get home from there. As soon as we got there, I ran onto the subway still crying and shaking. I probably looked like quite the sight. The subway eventually got to my school. Then I realized I couldn't go home. John knew where I lived, and he could have called the police. I didn't know what to do, and I saw someone with a phone charger. I ran over and asked if they could please charge my phone, and it was an emergency. Typical millennial me didn't know my friend's phone number. I charged my phone, face covered in tears, and probably smudged mascara, and immediately texted my friend. 
I told her right before my phone died that John and Karen wouldn't let me leave their car, and she had sent quite a few messages and had apparently tried to come to my house to look for me too. I told her where I was and asked if I could go to her place. I got many messages from John as well. John tried saying he tried to kill himself, that he needed me, that I needed him, that I was making a huge mistake, absolutely anything and everything to try and make me respond. I know you guys will judge me for this, but I went to visit him in the hospital. I don't know why after all that I decided to do this, but I did. After I got to the ER, his mom then told the nurse that I was also threatening suicide and needed to be put on suicide watch too. The nurse took me aside and asked me, and of course I said no. I was legally an adult, so they couldn't take Karen's word over mine, and didn't hospitalize me. I told John we were over, and I hoped he would get better soon. But he was mad at me. He said his mom told him how I was suicidal, and how she said that she heard the nurses talking to each other about how I was lying to get attention, and all this other BS. I tried to defend myself, but I just left defeated gave Karen the middle finger, and ran the fuck out and never looked back. I crashed at my friend's place and slept on her floor for over a week. A while later, I got a text from one of John's friends, basically insinuating he killed himself and that it was my fault. I told the guy that after what that family did to me, they could all go to hell, and to never message me again. I blocked the number. I have no idea if John is alive or not to this day. But I did get some revenge in the end. A story for another day, I suppose. As you well might have noticed, I didn't call the police. I did speak to an officer about it eventually, and my concerns about how Karen would be more reliable than me and how I didn't have much evidence. They said if I wanted I could file a report, but honestly I never did. I wanted nothing to do with them ever again. First, let me set up some background to make the flow of the story smoother. This happened almost 19 years ago. I was nearly 13 years old at the time, and I was being raised by my grandparents. We lived in a little tourist town in Florida. They had problems with their two daughters as adults, my mother being the older of the two and they wanted to do everything that they could to make sure that I didn't turn out the same way. A do-over, if you will. Needless to say, they were very strict. My aunt was having a good period. She had her stuff together, and we were all close. My aunt understood what it was like to be raised under a glass dome, metaphorically speaking. They had raised her too, after all. So being as she was my only aunt, she made sure that the time we spent together was always super cool. I would stay over Saturday nights. We would go out and hang out at the pier, and she would let me hang out with my middle school boyfriend who would find ways to get to wherever I was. My grandparents had no idea of any of these activities, of course. I was just spending some quality time with my aunt and giving them a break. It was nice that I had a younger female figure, since my mom wasn't in the picture. One night, when we were out having fun, my aunt meets this guy, and they really hit it off. He was very nice and introduced himself to me. He went by JR, and at first was a kind and charming talker. They exchanged numbers after hanging out for a while, and then we went home and went to bed. They ended up going out a bit more, and my aunt ended up really liking J.R. He took her to his home and introduced her to his father, and showed her around his land. He lived out in the woods in the middle of nowhere. I've lived in this town for 30 years, and I still to this day couldn't tell you where it is. I was only there once. He was teaching my aunt how to shoot a gun. I remember her shoulder rocking back with the impact of the shot, and it surprising her. He had these weird flamenco dancing clothes in his closet. It was all seemingly harmless. I mean, everyone has their quirks, I guess. About ten days, maybe two weeks later, we were again at the pier out by the payphones, 
talking about what to do that night and what to get for dinner. J.R. and my aunt were in their late twenties or early thirties, and as much as she loved me, I imagine there were times that I got a bit in the way. Well, anyway, we were at the pier and he was talking about how he has these painkillers. He offered me one. I declined, of course, and told him that I had a high tolerance to pain anyway and didn't really need that stuff. He then, with a huge smile, asked me if he can see for himself, assuring me that he won't really hurt me, and he's just trying to have fun. This bastard twists my arm behind my back until I hear a pop. I start to cry and he laughs and says, Aw, oh, sweetheart, I was only playing. You said you had a high tolerance. I guess I was a bit stronger than I thought. I'm sorry, uh, there's no need to ruin the good time we're all having. I go to the private peer office, which my granddad managed, crying. My aunt comes in and lets me know that she thinks it's fucked up too, and that she talked to him about it. She goes back outside and he asks her what she's up to that night. She tells him that she isn't sure if I'm staying over because of what just happened. I was whining about going home, and I was pissed that she hadn't decked him right there for hurting me. Well, he tells her that she should meet him under, well, let's call it the Sunset Bridge, at 2 a.m. on the other side of town. He says that the stars are beautiful, and you can listen and hear the fish. He tells her he would love to see it with her and they can dance under the moon. We were all from a fishing family and live in a fishing town, so fish activities under the bridge at late times wasn't necessarily something that threw up a red flag. If it's dark and late, there won't be other people around hogging all of the fish. She tells him maybe, and then we leave. I decide to spend the night after all, later sneaking in only if she will pick up my boyfriend Charlie. She calls him when she gets home, before we made our arrangement about Charlie, and says that she can come, but she'll have to have me with her. He groans and says, Fine, alright. I guess she can come too. Maybe she'll get tired and sleep in the car or something. About an hour after she called JR the first time, I ask her about Charlie and she agrees. She sits down with me and hugs me and touches my face lovingly, apologizing for what he did to my arm. My aunt was an amazing woman, and I love her very much. She then calls him again and tells him not to worry. She's picking up Charlie, so I'll have my own entertainment and they can have their time. He goes into a rage and starts sputtering and cursing about how it's too complicated now. He just wanted to have an intimate meeting with her and not some damn family reunion. He went on about how he didn't want to have to babysit a 13-year-old kid and her 14-year-old boyfriend. He hangs up after calling her a crazy bitch. She bewilderingly hung up the phone and told me what happened, and we went about our night with pizza rolls and PlayStation. He calls her a few more times and drives by the house for a couple of weeks, but my aunt was having none of it. After a while, he left our lives just as swiftly as he had come. The whole affair lasted only about a month, if even that. Three weeks, maybe. And all in all, it wasn't the craziest experience she's had with a man. JR was soon forgotten, and we went about our business. Flash forward two years later. I'm almost out of middle school by now. My aunt had moved to a city about 40 miles away. I still lived with my grandparents, and they were still strict, but as they had gotten older, so had I. I knew a few ways around the rules. One day my friend Frank and I missed the bus home from school and called our good high school friend Darla to pick us up and take us home after riding around a bit. She had this big beautiful red truck and I would ride around in the cab of it, loving the freedom and the wind. We were smoking cigarettes and laughing, listening to the radio. The time I would have spent on the bus before my stop was just enough time to hit up the taco drive through we cruised down the road a bit before heading back to Frank and I's separate houses. He lived just down the road. We had a lot of fun that day, and she dropped me off first. My grandparents came outside. They were heavily confused at the sight of an unknown vehicle, and even more so when they saw that I had gotten out of it. 
After letting her be the one to explain because she was older, cooler, and more responsible, my parents thanked her for being kind enough to take me home. And they said how lucky I was that she just happened to be there to help me get home. The things we do to our parents, eh? That was the last time I ever saw my friend. She didn't show up for work for five days. I can't speak for everyone, but I assumed she had just run away. Darla's parents were going through a nasty divorce. The dad had a hot new girlfriend, and the mother was very bitter about it. Rightfully so, I guess. It was embarrassing for all of the kids. Her truck wasn't left behind, so I figured she got tired of her parents acting like infants and took off. I missed her, but she was in a whole other league of freedom and coolness. Sixteen is a whole different life than fourteen, especially when you're in different schools. I wished her well, maybe even was a bit envious that she got out of this town and I was still here. I hadn't heard anything for two weeks about her, when at about nine at night, my grandparents got a phone call to turn on the news. Darla's body was found out in the woods. She had been strangled to death and just left out there. I don't even know for how long. I was devastated. I was joyful that I had that last experience with her but also saddened and horrified. She was so young, barely older than myself. She was about to be 17 in just a short time. It was a very sad time for our town. The good and bad news is that they caught the guy who had done it. He confessed after some very incriminating evidence, and during his questioning also confessed to killing his girlfriend, who had been missing for about eight years. Also, his father, staging his death to look like a suicide by hanging. When they showed his mugshot on the screen and said his name, I swear I almost passed out. There, clear as day on the screen, staring back at me, was a picture of J.R. I had no idea they even knew each other. I can't imagine what would have happened if we had gone under the bridge that night. Investigation Discovery Channel did a piece on it a couple of years back, and I was shocked to see it on the TV. The memories came rushing back, and I decided to write it all down. I literally have a newfound appreciation of life now that I'm old enough to understand just how close I could have come to being killed. My sister doesn't have a Reddit account, but as a long-time reader with no material of my own to post, I thought her story would work well for this sub. My sister has been married for several years, and this is the first time she genuinely felt unsafe in her own home. Her husband was finishing up school, and they had just had a baby, so she was pretty sleep-deprived. She's honestly gotten sick and my brother-in-law wanted her to get some decent rest, so he stayed with the baby in the living room in the nursery to take care of her while my sister slept. My parents wanted to see the baby, so my brother-in-law came over to our house for a bit and just let my sister rest. It should be noted that my brother-in-law is extremely paranoid, even though we live in a low-crime area. Since he's from a sketchy Midwestern town, I guess it makes sense. He makes sure that the doors and windows are locked before leaving, and half wakes my sister up to let her know he's going to our house with the baby, and that he'll pick up some dinner on the way back. My sister sleepily agrees and falls back asleep. Fast forward a couple of hours. My sister has to wake up to breastfeed slash breast pump because her chest is starting to hurt. She prolongs this and tosses and turns for a while because she was still exhausted and didn't quite want to get up. Once she starts coming to, she realizes that the house is super cold. Once she actually opens her eyes, she hears the front door shutting, but she's still super out of it. Assuming it's her husband, she calls out his name, but gets no answer. The room is pitch black, and all of the other lights in the house are off, so she can't see anything. Suddenly, she gets a really horrible feeling, which she can only describe as stepping into a freezing shower. She gets up and checks the thermostat, 
which was fine. She assumes she just feels cold because she's sick. She turns on some lights and does a quick turn about the house and realizes no one else is home and the front door is still locked. This obviously freaks her out and she texts her husband to ask when he'll be home. He gets home not long after. They have dinner and he stays with the baby in the living room and sleeps on the couch. My sister notices that one of the windows in the bedroom is open and says that she doesn't remember opening it. That would explain why she was so cold earlier. Her husband makes sure to check that all the windows are shut and the door is locked after my sister explains to him the weird feeling she got earlier. Later she wakes up again at around 2am to pump and that disgusting feeling creeps up again. She shoots up out of bed and can barely make out someone standing right at the foot of the bed. She thinks it's her husband, since it's a similar height and build, so she asks him to bring her some water while she's prepping to pump. The figure doesn't move or speak. She repeats herself, and in what she describes as the most terrifying moment of her life, the figure answered her. No, no, go back to sleep. I like watching you sleep. The voice definitely did not belong to my brother-in-law. She turns on her desk lamp and starts screaming at a person wearing all black. He just starts giggling. Her husband jolted out of his sleep, and she scrambled for the knife she had in her table. The dude booked it out of the window. He opened it and climbed through. She knows for sure that he was watching her sleep earlier when she was napping, and that it was probably him that she had seen shutting the bedroom door earlier. They called the police and filed a report, and nothing really came of it because he technically didn't do anything besides trespassing. They said they couldn't be sure if they could charge him with breaking and entering, because my sister doesn't remember if she opened the window or not. Idiots. They have no idea how he didn't injure himself when he jumped out of the window, because when my brother-in-law ran out back to give chase, he had already disappeared. It's been a few years, and nothing ever really came of the investigation. They had the windows and locks replaced. What is up, guys? Blue Spooky here, as always. Thank you guys so much for watching, especially if you made it this far to the end of the video. If you guys enjoyed the content of this video, please be sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe if you feel so inclined. If you do decide you like my content enough to subscribe, please be sure to hit the bell button right next to the subscribe button and turn notifications to all so you can be notified of every video I post in the future. If you don't feel like doing that though, I post a video nearly every day, so you can just come back every now and then and check up on what you missed. If you guys have any criticisms on what I can do better or any feedback on the stories in the video, please be sure to leave them in the comments below, as I always enjoy reading all the comments and I try to give them hearts and respond when I can. If you guys would like to reach me for any reason or you would like to send in a story to be read, you can go ahead and take a look in the description below the video. You'll find the link to all of my social media, including my Facebook, Gmail, and Twitter accounts. Go ahead and send me a message on any of those, and I'll try to get back to you as soon as possible. If you do decide to send in a story, please be sure to include in the tagline what the name of the story is if it has one, what type of story it is if it has a theme, and how you would like to be credited in the description of the video the story appears in. Last but not least, I also run two other channels, Mr. Blue Skies and Darkest Hour, where I do true crime videos and dark documentaries respectively. If that kind of content sounds interesting to you, why not go ahead and check it out and see if it is for you. Uh, aside from that though guys, I think that's pretty much it for now. So thank you guys so much for watching, and I hope you guys have a great day.